Three, two, one. If you don't like where you are, move. You are not a tree. That was a tweet in the movie <laughs> to freedom. <laughs> I'm Adam from your movie sex. This is Sardonicast. I'm Alex from IG and uh yeah, maybe one of the more memorable lines in whatever that thing is that you recommended. I, I struggle to call it a movie, but uh Oh. I suppose we'll get <laughs> we'll get on to that later, I guess. Yeah. I was more uh the quote I have in my head is uh the tooth. Yeah. That's what that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking oh, about yeah. the, uh, tooth lines. The tooth, yes. remember the tooth. Remember the tooth. <laughs> that's a good line. Also from <laughs> to freedom. We're gonna talk about Dune, everybody. We got some Dooney movies ahead of us. It's a very Dooney uh, Lots movie of day. Dunes. Um Triple Dune. Yeah. So I mean so we both rewatched part one. Uh-huh. Did you you I'm assuming you rewatched it before part two? Yeah, a couple of days before I saw part two, I refreshed my memory. Um not that it really faded to be honest. I'd seen it two or three times before that, and I've got a pretty settled opinion on the movie. Um or at least I thought I did before part two came out. Oh. Uh yeah, well that there were some things it did address that I that were bothersome that did you know bug me about the movie in part one, uh, but there were some things that I feel like, yeah, uh, kind of wind up just making part two a bit of a more polished, better experience overall. Um, but for example, some of the things I did like was how it kind of addressed or at least mimic mimicked the structure of that first movie mm -hmm. where. There's like a it, it crescendos to this huge siege action sequence where the whole all the Atreides family is taken out and I guess spoilers for Dune there's going to be endless Dune spoilers throughout this discussion I'm sure but uh, yeah after that whole sequence there's this kind of lull in the pace of the story and it's just I guess a byproduct of having to cut a novel in half like right at the midpoint where it, obviously it's not going to flow naturally and you are cutting it off at an awkward point and it mm -hmm. kind of hurts the structure of the movie or so i thought more so with it kind of concluding with this knife fight with this guy and then like really quickly establishing these rules with the fremen and this whole like oh yeah the, we have this rule where you got to fight to the death and it's like really quickly all summarized and it just feels kind of clunky in the whole overall structure of that first film um, but with the way two wraps up and kind of mimics that structure of the first one, I felt like, oh, the, this is kind of retroactively improving aspects and structural choices and pacing choices of that first movie that, uh, yeah, did feel like payoff. Um, more things that weren't addressed or couldn't really be fixed about that first movie, to me, it were just some strange kind of audio music yeah. timing choices and why there's there's so many good timing choices with the editing and like presentation of things but the the ones that are off time are like so distracting to me are so mm -hmm. pull me out of the movie so much uh be it i i just can't get down with the the kind of main theme vocals <laughs> when it, when the, the way it's used <laughs> in that first movie it's like yeah. I don't know if it's just when it's... It must be the timing of when it's used because that same theme is used in part two and it didn't nearly pull me out in the it's same way. It's also used less actually felt like it complemented what was going on. It's also used yeah. much mm -hmm. less. Yeah, it feels like it's trying to insist a scope that it is already delivering in spades anyway and it's like, man, you don't really need this. Like, everything else that's going on is is plenty. And the rest of the music outside of that, I think, is actually quite good and really feeds into this overall mood and atmosphere mm -hmm. which especially carries that first part because uh that's another thing about the first part is the the lead character of paul is uh he doesn't really get interesting until the second half of the novel yeah. he's kind of a lot of <laughs> a lot of he's a lot of what's happening is uh happening to him he doesn't have much agency and he b becomes a lot more interesting as soon as he starts gathering power mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what is going on in the world which is mostly what happens in part two so he feels fairly static in that first movie but for me it's kind of propped up by 
that really strong foundation it sets with the world building, with explaining all the different faction, like visually setting up all the different like factions and the dynamics of the families and all these these eugenics witches and all of this lore and all of this dense stuff and all this really complicated sci-fi stuff that, uh, well, as <laughs> as we'll get to when we talk about Lynch's version, is probably more difficult than you'd imagine to adapt on the screen. And you yeah, know, it's. It's part of the Dune. Uh, it's, it's, it's just known as one of those. Yeah, it is a cursed story. It's like notoriously difficult to adapt and translate. And uh, I think what he's been able to do by splitting it in two parts and committing to it, I'm just glad it's come together and people seem to really be reacting to it. I really felt like it, it paid off in the end, and it was it was risky and. Yeah, it falters here and there, but overall, I'm I'm pretty pleased with how this came together, and I'm I'm glad it's getting like a response, and it's like all perfectly timed as well. The way it's all bubbled to this point, because it's like right as other big tentpole sci-fi franchises that people are like upset about yeah. dying, or like there's this vacuum right now. It's the it's new like, Star Wars, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a huge vacuum, and now it's been filled in by this thing, uh, which helps one of Dune's kind of inherent problems through no fault of its own. Um, in cinema form, it's just kind of had a lot of its tricks stolen from it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Being written in the 60s and inspiring so much of the big yeah. sci-fi tropes we know now. It's That's one of the funnier things about part two for me was how like some of these big trope reveals that if they weren't already so ingrained in like sci-fi cinema, they might have been made to be more of a big deal but like yeah <laughs> just because the nature of where sci-fi is in 2024 2023 we've got to kind of let's just move past some of this let's focus more on the scope of this and the the mood and the atmosphere and just sell it uh yeah, yeah. it it does a, a, at least accomplish something unique with its atmosphere and tone and presentation overall like you don't see this type of filmmaking in a Star Wars movie. No, so, not typically. Yeah, at least it has that going for it. I don't know. I'm like I maybe I'm going to have to rewatch part 1 after having seen part 2, but I still mm. I I still my experience with part 1, it doesn't feel like build up. Like cuz cuz build up it it just feels like a lot of nothing. <laughs> Really, you, you don't yeah. you don't think the each each time Paul is kind of uh, introduced to the spice and it kind of instigates these weird hallucinations into the future and it's showing hints that you do oh, those wind are some up of the worst parts. in part two that part um, where he like where he, where he's like in the battle and then it reveals his face inside the mask but his head's like way <laughs> yeah. too big for it and it's like one of the worst effects in the movie. That is one of the weakest shots, yeah. That's like like the weakest shot. Period. <laughs> yeah, there are a couple. Yeah. That was one of the other things I noted down was there was just I don't know, maybe like ten, fifteen percent of some of the visual effects were just not quite there. Yeah. Um in that, Very in that noticeably. first movie. Yeah, like it, the the first time you see like the worm mouth and stuff, it it just seems like I don't know, it needed a few more renders or like they were really struggling yeah. to get the scale and scope of it together or against not that polished. budget or something like this. That's not, and I still think the majority of the effects work is very good. Um, and with the, the scale of it and the scope of it and the, how many visual effect shots there are, the majority of them are good, but there are some that really do stand out. And that first movie like that, that shot you mentioned with the weird CG Timothy face. Um, yeah. So awkward. But yeah, it it does feel like a, a building narrative to me, uh, with with a sense of intrigue, with the the whole I don't know the eugenics, which is the Bene Gesserit and the ninety uh, generations of uh, tinkering they've been doing to try mm -hmm. and I don't know they're like pulling the strings and always kind of winning at the top of it all, and I I like the kind of uh, the royalty side of it and these. That whole framing of it's cool. And ju just at the base level, the I mentioned it in the part one review, just the building everything up on this whole like ecology angle with this planet, this desert planet that starts. Um, they don't really get into it 
on too much in the film as far as like the very base ecology level of how like the doom planet works with the like sand plankton that the worms eat and the worms mm-hmm. eat it and they're attracted to vibrations because they eat other worms and you formulate the spice from the worms and the, the spice allows for space travel but it also has uh psychoactive effects that kind of gets the whole story going and the Bene Gesserit like abuse the spice and use it to control people and it's like man this is just so much intrigue to the setup of the world and all the all the crossover and uh just science fiction ideas that are explored and like like a like a cooler version of avatar you know with this with this uh tree with generations of mm-hmm. <laughs> experiences poured into them they d- they even go more into that in part two with like instilling fetuses accidentally with thousands of years of memories and the weird creepy horror angles that gets into and man there's so this this universe is so intriguing to me that even though part one isn't the most exciting um with like the you don't really get any payoffs in that first movie um but it is yeah, barely. i feel like a necessary foundation and setup to get what you get in part two and it, together i feel like it flows pretty well do you feel do you feel like the the runtime of the first film was necessary because maybe what i'm trying to get out of a, a movie because i'm i'm like there's the universe in of itself is not something that i'm immediately just like imprinting on like i'm not it's it's not mm. a mass effect for me uh what you're describing your experience is like oh like basically mass effect like oh i want to see more of this yeah. universe sort of thing i don't yeah, get yeah. that out of this movie and so i'm forced to just kind of attach myself on to like characters and the goals of characters specifically mm-hmm. or how a character is developing and it really felt like like Timothée Chalamet did not really have that much to work with in part one because he's just like honestly the second time I watched it it was kind of revealing to me just how much I at least felt he didn't really work (laughs) for the character because the character didn't have that much to work with part two it really comes together and he actually transforms and there's something interesting happening with him but in part one you're absolutely right things are just more or less happening around him (laughs) you know like yeah i i it's difficult for me to grasp onto something and i just wind up if if i don't have that out of like a character yeah he does have very little agency i'm sure there are some exceptions to this but like it it really prevented me from i i I think it's part of the reason why i'm just not as into the universe is because there's no character for me to attach onto within the universe and then i just wind up getting i don't know bored (laughs) and and it's difficult for me to pay attention and then i just get confused i'm like why is anything happening again that's kind of my experience with the first film yeah i guess where it injures it more to me is where you have like you know aquaman the duncan idaho character where he has moments of like there's a lot of imp- implied history there, sort of friendship, and it all boils to a, a sacrifice moment in a hallway. Uh, and it just kind of means, because it's just skipped over so quick, there's not much of an emotional response like when he mm-hmm. does sacrifice himself. And there's some kind of similar character issues in part two that I was having as far as big things are happening to these big main characters, and I, I'm not really emotionally responding. And it's more the scale of everything and that framing of everything. And yeah, the kind of, especially more like quick pace in the second one uh, that was carrying it for me. Cause it, yeah, it's not, it's not really, it doesn't feel character driven to me. It feels a lot more uh, like plot and world driven. And especially the kind of cherry on top that Denis Villeneuve brings is that, that just heavy atmosphere and mood that, that sells the whole idea and concept to me because uh, mm-hmm. that is we're dealing with some wacky ideas I could just tease like the talking fetuses and especially like the uh, you know Star Wars the force so like you got people mind controlling people and giant worms it's like a, a lot of goofy stuff to sell um, and he's intent on giving it a serious edge to try and <laughs> sell it and I think it mostly does work uh, especially in, in part two. Um, 
and that it's it's kind of a Denis thing. He he has that certain coldness to his presentation, mm -hmm. which he he likes, uh, and I think that especially works well for the villains. I love every time the the Harkonnens uh, have a scene. Basically, like the <laughs> the. They're that that trope of the mustache twirling, killing all of their men, kind of mm -hmm. idea to to the to the absolute extreme. Like it's it's so over the top and extreme with the the flying baron imagery, and he's like killing people left and right. Um, it's, yeah, it's so extreme, um, and a good a good kind of uh, way I've seen it described. Like I, I didn't note down which review I saw it in um, when I was just looking through some of the part one reviews the other day. Some referred to it as maximalist minimalism, like the style of these films. And I feel like it's a good yeah, way. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, because there, there is definitely a real scope, but it's it's often obs obscured in a way that, you know, lets your mind fill in some of the gaps and it's not showing you every single uh, element to fill in the world. It's, it's just like a nice balance, a nice medium. You're getting what you want to see. You still got the big action scenes with the ornithopters like flying around through doing trench runs and whatnot mm -hmm. but you also do get more you know shots like that weird it's just this like weird spider creature in one shot like obscured like mm -hmm. <laughs> crawling around on the floor and they're like get out <laughs> it's like never elaborated on it doesn't matter uh but it's the kind of texture that like really makes it interesting to exist in the world and sells it for me um yeah really really awesome atmosphere yeah, I wish I could connect to part one in a more meaningful way. But yeah, my second watch really just solidified that it's just it's just not for me. And I'm just, you know, watching <laughs> watching the film and every single line is is delivered like it's the most important thing ever said. And the you know, the visuals are consistent, but the effects are unpolished in many shots and it doesn't help me to believe that the world is is a real thing yeah just that it, not my thing i got very very sleepy mm. very 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 sleepy yeah selling the whole uh yeah as you just put it that these are like the most important things ever said i feel like that's a good way of kind of putting what the first film struggles with mm -hmm. the second one picks up some of the some of the slack on with the the whole prophecy kind of chosen one angle. Um, I didn't really understand or get what it was going for in that first one because it seems like it could just be any other prophetic, mm -hmm. the one type story you've seen before. Um, but again, you don't really get into the meat of what that is setting up until part two. So yeah, there's there's, there's just not that much to play with with that just kind of endless setup and yeah maybe they could have chopped it down a little bit to get some more just to have it flow better because i feel like it's it's not even what they're showing it's more just the pace of it that is the issue of that first yeah. movie like it does it does really suffer in the, in the second half um but I, I i just don't even know that critique's almost built into the idea of splitting it into part one and two with it being one book like it's not an issue that like the lord of the rings had to deal with because it the trilogy had one book each and each book had a beginning middle and end whereas we're just splitting a story in the in the middle it doesn't get an end so it's like yeah. <laughs> inherently inherently unsatisfying from that angle but if you buy into that being okay which i feel like i did with the caveat being that part two would bring it all together and pay off what was set up which i feel like it did i c i'm more okay with part one um in retrospect, um, there's definitely yeah plenty of awkward stuff though. Like uh, I don't know, like it is more on the character stuff. Like Josh Brolin, like he's mm -hmm. good when he's in it, uh, and I know he's got like more parts to play in two, and uh, that when three eventually comes out, uh, it's just like. It's more the yeah the visuals that I'm invested in than the actual characters, but I think that's okay. I think that's kind of the point of what he's going for with this big sci-fi epic. It doesn't always need to be as long as you're entertained or invested in what's going on. I feel like I'm okay with that, uh, especially with the kind of unpredictable way it does twist and turn in that second part. 
regarding these prophecies and mm -hmm. yeah, some of the more twisted places it goes. Yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about part two. Did you uh, change your rating for part one, by the way? Because you, uh, I remember at the, uh... I kept it the same. So you, what? You give it a seven? I think. Um, no, I gave it a. Ooh. It was an eight, so four okay. star. Uh, and it's kind of remained at that, yeah, with that heavy caveat as, yeah, this is the beginning, this is the setup, and that when we get the payoff, let's see how this this comes together. <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do feel like it, it has come together and it has paid off a lot of that setup um, in a way that might, yeah, even be more polished as to what I kind of got 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 out earlier. Um, I wasn't pulled out of part two really at all in the four or five times I am, um, some of the more awkward stuff in that first movie. I changed my rating from a six to a five. <laughs> I saw that, yeah. <laughs> And you don't have any other thoughts after part two. It's still in a vacuum. Oh, as in to, to retrospectively? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would have to watch it again. <laughs> I would oh, have to man. watch it for a third time <laughs> to really see. Because I can't just... It's it's kind of difficult for me because it doesn't, it doesn't feel... Like, I, I watched part two and I really enjoyed it. And I'm like, damn, you could have just... Like, part one could have been like 20 minutes. You could have just started at part two. I would have been fine. You know, that that's how I Man, feel. I think so. I really, yeah. For my experience and what I got out of it, I'm just... You know, I understand that most people are getting something entirely different out of that first movie, but I'm just not. And I'm, I'm, I struggled to twice. So I just... I. Uh, so you want like part one in a prologue? I want, like the, I just, yeah, I want both like of them minutes, fucking just, do, 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 do. <laughs> mashed together. Give me like one four hour movie or something. And then, then it'll feel like a build up. Then part <laughs> one will feel like a build up if it's only like an hour and a half or less. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I do like that build up, but there are scenes that don't work. There are aspects of that first movie that don't, but. A lot of that build up, a lot of that cleverly placed exposition, the way it's done. I like it. Um I feel like you really need that. You you can't just go straight to part two because that's that's you need the foundation of the setup for the, mm -hmm. for the payoff, I, I feel like. Uh yeah, I mean, well that if if it's a four hour movie and they do an hour and a half of part one and then two and a half hours of part two, I think that would be fun. Okay. Yeah, I, I just I don't know how they could trim so much out of that first movie because there, there's a lot of like important exposition in there. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I like the structure like more in retrospect now, like because that that was my big hang up. Like it, it felt weird to to end on like a little one on one knife fight, where it's like, yeah, it feels like it's all uh, echoing itself now uh, in an unexpected way for me as someone who wasn't read the book yet yeah well here's the thing i saw the david lynch version which we'll get to <laughs> and the best version and that's what only two and a half hours long uh slightly under i think yeah it's it's not that long 217 my biggest complaint with the pacing of that is that the ending felt very anticlimactic but yeah it's more than the ending it's like the last hour yeah yeah so so that should have been longer. I think there's somewhere in between two, two and a half hour long movies and one two hour, 15 minute movie or something. I, I feel like there's somewhere in between those two things that would be perfect for me. Because mm. it is, you know, like it is possible to trim down the story and it is possible to present it in a way that isn't exactly like the book because neither of the films are. They have to take some sort of creative liberty or or even uh, liberty with the pacing and, and structure in mm -hmm. order to translate it to a film. Yeah, the the perfect the perfect version for me exists somewhere, maybe in a fan cut, <laughs> which yeah. is often the case for me. But yeah, it seems like we got the. 
you know, like with the Lord of the Rings, the extended versions, it seems like we started yeah, true. there. That is you what know? it feels like. Um, but but there won't be there won't be an, a shorter, yeah, more digestible version, um, and there definitely won't be an even longer version because I don't think I was reading it doesn't believe in them or something. Don't know. If, that's uh, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. He says every scene that's cut is like he doesn't believe in deleted scenes. I think was the quote. Yeah, it was it was both. I think, um, which I I understand the philosophy of. It's like, yeah, this was an intentional decision. I could have left all of this in. I could have left all this out. Like we needs to stop somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. which, yeah, I can appreciate it. Uh, part two. Did you see it in IMAX? Or wait, that doesn't exist near you. You said. Yeah, yeah, it, it went bust. Uh, my local one, so I couldn't see it in IMAX. Uh, but yeah, I saw it on a good screen. I feel like I got to appreciate those visuals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's definitely one of the best things about it, just like that first movie, just like a lot of his movies, um, just like part one, the atmosphere, that tone from from like second one, when it hits you with that weird uh, like throat singing audio. Um, you know, the power of a spice is power for all. Let's so, mm. yeah, just get you in. And yeah, it it just did feel like they were they were confident and familiar with this world. They'd set up, they'd got they they basically got the hard work out of the way, and it's like now we can have fun in this world. Now we can play with the the setup. We can add layers on top of it, make it more complicated, explore it, take these characters somewhere. And it's like yeah, this is the meat of the story. You get the spectacle towards the end. It doesn't it kind of flutter out in the same way. It's uh, yeah, it feels complete mm -hmm. with. Yeah, with with still space to expand, it still feels like a a whole universe. With uh, we're only scratching the surface of. Um, I know mean, this is like well, the the first book of six books was split into two. Movies. I didn't know there were that many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they get crazy. Uh, okay, from like some of the synopsis I've read, like uh, and Denis, I think, is only interested in covering. The first two books, Shit. so Dune Damn it. and Dune Messiah, uh, because I was, uh, <laughs> that means someone else is going to take over if it's successful. Warner Brothers. Well, yeah, if it keeps making like, money, yeah. Fucking Mark Webb or somebody. So, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. But yeah, after <laughs> after Dune Messiah, it starts getting like they do like thousands of year time skips, and there are like worm gods, and it gets like quite crazy. Um, so <laughs> I almost want to get there just to see if someone like can even try. Um, I know there was like a TV show in the early two thousands that did. But, yeah, uh, I mean Warner Brothers will try <laughs> if they're all successful. <laughs> God damn it, they'll try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I'm sure the whatever the trilogy we wind up getting from Denis will be a complete story in and of itself. Uh, and yeah, Messiah, I think, takes place. There's a huge time jump after that, too. I think it's like 12 years or something. So mm. got to age up Timothy a little bit in time for that. But people are liking it. It's making a ton of money. We're probably going to get it. Um, it is uh, the number 11 on the top 250. Yeah, it's, it's like number five or six on Letterboxd as well right now. Um, Hilarious. That that classic recency bias. Mm-hmm. Just like it means nothing, like just you might as well just ignore it. <laughs> For yeah, like a whole year. So this is this is a film that uh, I wasn't scribbling notes down as I was watching it because I felt like that would have been too much for me. Because <laughs> I felt kind of like <laughs> sick beforehand. I felt like I I don't remember exactly what happened, but I was like. I felt like stomach sick. Oh, nothing to do with the movie. And uh, I almost didn't go. I almost was like, yeah, you guys go on without me. And then oh, really? I just toughed it out, vomited a little, drank some Pepto-Bismol, <laughs> and went to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was great. I felt better once I, was, once I threw up a little. I don't remember why I was sick. Yeah. Sometimes that's the, the cure rule. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I must have ate something weird, but yeah, I uh it was definitely a lot easier for me to digest, especially with these 
character progressions, not just the main character, but I also loved Javier Bardem's character. I love the dynamics between like the different uh, groups within the what are they called? The Fremen or whatever. The they're Fremen, like, yeah. Yeah, they're like the the people from the north believe this, and the people from the south don't believe that. Blah, blah, blah. Like I thought, I thought that it was interesting enough and well set up enough, and they were doing enough with what they set up. You know, they were able to set things up and have things happen rather than just set things up and wait for part two. And prom- yeah, promise yeah. something's going to come later. Yeah. Yeah, Javier was, uh, he was really good for uh, adding a bit of humanity mm-hmm. to that cast and for, especially to counteract some of that coldness I was just saying about. And I feel like Zendaya True. did a good job for that as well, uh, just adding a bit of humanity to the... Because like the... It's it's part of how they're written and how they conceptualize like the Bene Gesserit eugenics witches that they are obviously cold and distant and you wouldn't expect them to be any other way. But the, you know, one of the main characters is one of these. Paul is half of one of those, having a bit of variety as far as like the way people are emoting and presenting themselves does definitely help when you get to those Fremen characters because yeah, that does affect part one. Yeah. Yeah, I was <laughs> I was kind of you know, it, almost wishing that they were a significant part of part 1. But I yeah, guess they couldn't be. Also his performance was really great cuz I'm used mm-hmm. to hearing him have a very particular accent in every single movie that I've seen him in that I can remember. And he yeah, changed yeah. it up enough and it felt consistent enough. Where I was like, oh, it's not just Javier Bardem. I was able to see like an actual character. Unlike Christopher Walken, who tried <laughs> to change his accent, a <laughs> little bit slipped through. <laughs> you can't do it. And even if even if it didn't slip through at all, he's just so such a pop culture meme at this point that seeing him just felt really out of place. I didn't feel like he was a character in the universe. I felt like he was Christopher Walken. That was a bit of a downside. Even though, even though he didn't occupy much of the screen time, but still, I don't know if I needed that casting. Yeah, that's, that's not a at good all. Point because I, I like a lot of the other casting, um, like Florence Pugh. I thought was a good pick for that princess character. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that is that is a confusing one. But again, as you said, very very small amount of screen time. There's much more of an emphasis on the Baron and the Harkonnens. Uh, and their screen presence mm-hmm. yeah, much stronger, much stronger than the Emperor, and that he's just more of kind of a plot device. I really liked Austin Butler in this. I thought that he transformed into his character very well, um, both performance and makeup wise. It was like a new thing to see, and it was very consistent, uh, very intimidating, very well. Uh, realized. Mm, interesting. I didn't really love that character, if I'm mm-hmm. honest. Um, that was one of the parts I didn't love as much. I just didn't feel like I got a very good impression as to what it was all about. It's kind of one of the more rushed over aspects to me because he's, he's set up basically as the Bene Gesserit's like, backup plan, right? It's like, <laughs> oops, we like messed up with Timothy and we can't control him anymore. Let's... Uh, Luckily, we've been kind of brewing this project in the background, and now let's have them have a knife fight. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was okay, but I was, I guess I was feeling more how you were feeling with Christopher Walken with Austin Butler, where I just kept seeing Austin Butler. Oh, that's funny. Um, Kept seeing, kept seeing that mouth. I kept, I I swear, I I heard a couple Elvis lines coming out. Oh no, he's still trying to get rid of that voice. (laughs) I swear, I caught a couple of them. Baby, baby, baby. (laughs) because <laughs> otherwise he was doing quite a good sort of he was definitely channing channeling stellan skarsgård's weird like throaty voice thing he's doing as the baron he was like trying to channel that and when he did that it did work but i, was, I swear i was hear- hearing a little bit of the king in there um that's hilarious <laughs> but i also f- I, f- I felt like the the dave batista uh character was like more interesting to me as far as like his kind of pathetic dynamic. He's like hiding from the Baron, like his fuck ups. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of hoping for more punishment to come to him, to be honest, considering how evil they are. But uh, 
foot kissing. Yeah, it is more foot kissing. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry to anyone that uh, this might ruin the character for, but every single time I saw him on screen, I just, I, I just kept thinking of Tourette's dad. Because he was always yelling, <laughs> he was always really loud, and just some of the delivery oh, just reminded me. Dad. I know, right? I forgot until I saw this movie. <laughs> Dave Batista's on screen going "Ah, piss!" like basically every fucking line. Ah, <laughs> uh, it was just uh, I, oh, yeah, man. I was I was amusing myself. <laughs> just every single time he's on screen, just constantly <laughs> yelling, constantly mad. I was like, "Yeah, that's Tourette's dad." Yeah, that was fun for um, me. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> but I, I don't know, just one of the more consistent through lines I feel like is just the the visual way uh, Villeneuve and his team have adapted the kind of displays of power uh, that the book is so well known for and like... Because it is all these big, royal families that have been fighting for generations, and the visuals need to match that. And the story is about this like manufactured prophecy, which yeah, I keep going back to as one of the more kind of interesting parts of that. That does put a spin on that angle of like, yeah, everyone's acting like he's the one, but does he deserve to be the one? Is he believing his own hype here? Like he knows what is set up and he starts getting into this weird pattern of having visions of the future and doing everything he can to try and stop what he's seen as a vision from happening but in trying to stop it <laughs> he kind of makes it worse and it's like I guess into these quite like deep ideas of uh, like responsibilities of power and this kind of deterministic nature of this world and the nature of evolution and like, can you beat evolution and take hold of it? And it's like really cool. And exactly what I love about sci-fi as a genre. And mm -hmm. it keeps me, yeah. Thinking and super engaged in this world and just makes me want to read more about this world and read more about the water of life and all this kind of craziness and just the ritualistic kind of religious nature of how they delve into it. And we yeah, have Javier Bardem, like whipping out lines, uh, about like yeah, don't waste your tears on the dead and getting into the culture of the Fremen and it's like, oh yeah, these are this is cool that the the writing and world building is so deep that they've thought about all these concepts and cultures and like, yeah, what what would happen if there were groups of people that have adapted to this harsh environment over thousands of years and yeah, they probably would worship water and have these cultural landmarks and all of this stuff and managing to convey all of this to an audience as well that doesn't just feel like you're being read to or talked to is i don't know, I feel like it's quite a skill especially with how broadly it's connecting i feel like it's it's just the right approach to tell the story and it just feels like man it's it's cool to get a sci-fi story that kind of goes the way it goes and winds up where it does with <laughs> paul atreides basically becoming this conqueror who's going to start a holy war uh -huh. that spreads across the entire universe it's like that's really cool that like <laughs> that's the story we got and it's like they didn't feel the need like the lynch one to kneecap it at the end and give it a overly happy ending mm -hmm. and it's like oh th this is this is awesome it's like proper storytelling it's living up to the book and so the yeah. the uh visions he has of like millions of people starving is like a result of yeah. him coming to power and that's essentially implied to to be in motion right yeah yeah he just cool. doesn't know when that's going to happen in the future yeah but it's going to happen and that's why zendaya is pissed yeah yeah that that's one of the big changes from the book i was reading is that in the book, the Zendaya character is more just like, yeah, I love you, Paul. Oh, really? You're, you're the chosen one, like kind of straight away, whereas there's more friction okay, and cool. tension here. That's interesting. Which, yeah, I think it's going to make Messiah interesting how they're going to have to write some of the framings of things. But I'm looking forward to how they're going to do it because that is much more interesting mm -hmm. instead of just like... <laughs> everyone already believing your hype immediately uh, yeah and especially if like so messiah i'm assuming will follow the same characters 
Yeah, yeah, just 12 years later, I think it is. So it's it's good to have Villeneuve at the helm, <laughs> you know, yeah. w- with him making that change, knowing where it's going, which is funny because we compared this to Star Wars earlier. <laughs> like one of the one of the biggest mistakes that new Star Wars made is just directors fighting with each other over <laughs> what they're doing with yeah. the story. No plan, <laughs> like, no consistency. Oh, we're, we'll yeah. set this up and then, oh, I'm going to change everything. And no, actually, no, it was <laughs> not changed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's funny. Wow. Like an actual trilogy with a consistent voice. Like that's not <laughs> know, something we see right? that often. <laughs> but yeah, that was I guess one of the one of the minor dings for part two for me going back to the kind of character stuff was I I wasn't exactly invested in the Zendaya Timothy romance. Because I think just <laughs> the nature of the the politics, the world building, the exposition, like getting in a convincing love story in there without, you know, Star Wars episode twoing it too much could have been a problem. Um, so it, it it is very quick. I don't really feel the sand was everywhere. <laughs> True. <Yeah. laughs> you can't even you can't disconnect Star Wars from it. Is the thing no like it. Which is God unfortunate. Damn, it was a, a, a lot, like, taken from. Because <laughs> as, as to what I was, like, teasing at earlier with the whole reveal towards the end of part two, just doubling down with spoiler warning, with the, the Baron turning out to be Paul's grandfather. It's just kind of, like, quite matter-of-fact, the way it's delivered, because it's like, yep, you this this like equivalent kind of beat is definitely been yeah. stolen. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. What's so funny, like, because we were talking about AI in the last episode, and that you know how many people mm-hmm. are talking about like, okay, no, you have to not only credit every single possible piece of work that the AI learns from, which you know is not a bad thing, but like people are talking about like payouts. For that like in a licensing mm-hmm. sense it's like i don't know george would have to owe some fucking money <laughs> to doing that right or <laughs> yeah kurosawa and you know name <laughs> name any piece of media you would like we, we'd have to start issuing retroactive payouts because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this, this is there's a lot there's quite a quite a lot they were really lucky that there wasn't a dune film adaptation before star wars and that the one that even happened in the 80s just turned out did not connect with people. Did not work out, yeah. yeah. Star Wars wound up becoming like the dominant voice in those same tropes. <laughs> yeah, it, it, like I feel like it owns a lot of the imagery, even mm-hmm. like it, it's kind of it's coming back Which now sucks. with the you know the desert the desert planet thing, but like it's what is known as the desert planet from science fiction. Like it's yeah, <laughs> m- maybe it'll start changing now. But what yeah. a heck. <laughs> come on what a fucking heck <laughs> piece of shit yeah um, I felt like the action was a lot better than way better one. and there was more uh, of it there were more set pieces like there's memorable set pieces there's like maybe two memorable set pieces that I have in my mind from the first film Whereas this has several. Yeah, well, I feel like something that hurts all the Dune movies in cinema form is the the shield technology thing. Like it, it's really difficult a to make cool and b mm-hmm. to explain. <laughs> yeah, outside of a novel format, and it, I, it's just not cool in that in that first movie where there's like two armies on the stairs like clashing into each other and it's kind of really awkwardly just going like dzz, dzz, and it's like obscuring it and you i don't know it, it just isn't very clear what's going on and that, that 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 line what is it the uh slow blade penetrates the shield yes <laughs> Whatever. ah yes the slow um, blade penetrates the shield <laughs> <laughs> yeah extraordinary. It's just, that stuff's clunky I like how it manifests in some of the big one of the big action set pieces in part one with all the ships being destroyed by the you know like uh-huh. zooms in on these slow down missiles that are like exploding these ships but when it comes to hand to hand combat with the shield stuff that's clunky um, 
and like the knife fight at the, at the end of part one. It's it's an excuse to have hand to hand combat. Like that's the whole point. Instead of people shooting each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's like a world building thing they're stuck but with. Then, but then it's kind of weird because then people do shoot each other with slow bullets. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that it's one. It's so I, it's a it's an odd universe with that in it, especially. I feel like yeah, it's it's when you read it on a page, it kind of hits different to when you've got to. I'm sure visually explain some of these concepts. Like you could have the entire movie without that, right? <laughs> like yeah, it wouldn't be I, like I, the I do fans admit, would be I was expecting it because it seems like a I was very expecting important it part to be of the more books, but, yeah. like important to part two as far as like how some of the story comes together. But yeah, it doesn't. I don't know. It doesn't seem <laughs> that crucial to uh, set mm-hmm. everything up because uh, I don't. Yeah, it's not really in part two nearly in the same way because a lot of that hand to hand action is way more restricted to the fremen like hiding in the sand and twirling around people um, mm-hmm. and that style of action which yeah choreographed a lot better than the first movie whereas yeah the only time it really gets to shine in that first movie is that knife fight towards the end which works better because they don't have to have the shields on because of the those fremen fight to the death rules so uh yeah that was one thing i did prefer over part two for sure um, yeah Especially when it wasn't weighed down by uh, unfinished looking visual effects, I just I just didn't notice that. Um, maybe not at all. Rewatches, um, no, but like no, I the re- effects really were really fucking felt great polished. In this movie. And, yeah, yeah, it really did feel like it could match the scape and scope of what it was showing. It um, really, it really did feel but, like this was the same director as Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Uh huh. Which is kind of why I was so disappointed with part one's unpolished effects i'm like come on like your last movie never felt this way it was like some of the most groundbreaking incredible like consistent effects work of the decade yeah yeah so i'm glad that he's back on track with that and who knows what exactly caused that in part one just i don't know they rushed it wanted to hit a date i I have no idea yeah because their budgets aren't that different no, you're right. Um, I was expecting to have like a huge difference in the budget, but no. I don't know how much time they had for pre-production, but that probably could have helped um, going into. Yeah, part true. Two. A lot of the expenses were already made. With a lot of these envir- environments designed, worms already designed. A lot of the deserts are designed. Uh, yeah, and like character and models, things. they could improve on instead of creating from scratch. Yeah, yeah, and it's not like. A Star Wars is something where you're like planet hopping to a different biome every five minutes. Most mm. of Dune is in the desert. Um, yeah, they're mostly yeah. restricted to that. Or uh, you get the cool uh, sequence of the the home world of the the Baron or whatnot with the black sun and the, that fun little scene. Some yeah, really striking, memorable imagery. Actually, I've got to shout out the uh, director of photography. Uh, Greg Fraser mm-hmm. did like the Batman Rogue One uh, cinematographer on uh, some of the Mandalorian the creator not a great film but visually very good mm-hmm. clearly got an eye yeah some really good stuff in there I love that that overhead shot of the crowds of people with that small gap in the middle with Paul uh, going through the hordes of his loyal followers and Mm -hmm. yeah there's heaps of yeah heaps of stuff like that yeah i remember that shot yeah the uh black light planet was Mm -hmm. cool interesting little set piece yeah i love every sprinkle they do of world building with the different factions and like setting them up uh but yeah the one i guess i'm most kind of obsessed with are these benny jesuit witches or whatever and that, i've been saying about the the fetus <laughs> uh character that gets a slight change from the book and in in the lynch film you can see the other way it can kind of go where 
yeah, there's this procedure with the water of life that gives you thousands of years of Bene Gesserit memories. Um, and it's like this overwhelming experience that changes you and basically, as they describe it, like would kill you. You're, you're basically dying because <laughs> you're getting just other lifetimes put into you, mm -hmm. uh, countless. Uh, and yeah, this, this quirk of... Uh, the mother character not not revealing that she's pregnant, so then this fetus gets all these memories and starts having these conversations with her mother. And in the in the book, there's a time jump, and the baby winds up being born. So you have this little girl walking around, acting like a like she's thousands of years old with thousands of years of knowledge, which is definitely one way of taking it, and definitely works in a written format probably better than you could pull off <laughs> in cinema. At least it would be. A different challenge, you know, not having to find a, a little girl who can sell that concept and keeping it to this, these weird, like, close-ups of a fetus inside the stomach having these conversations. And I just think that's a cool, creepy, weird concept that has potential to uh, go places, uh, especially in Messiah with the time jump and just the implications of where that's going to go. It's just, yeah, proper sci-fi concepts being uh explored mm -hmm. everything almost everything that i had an issue with in part one is not really an issue in this film the music was better mm -hmm. uh yeah i was never pulled out from the music like i do a couple times in the first movie because there, there are even a couple of performances in part one that pulled me out like there's there's a moment where there's like a, a fremen subject kind of like screams uh when she's handing a knife to one of the Bene Gesserit characters and she's like screaming in overwhelm that like the prophecy is coming coming to life or whatever uh there's just something about the again the timing of the way it's delivered it's like almost comical the way you're like surprised by this scream and it, it like rings like the wrong emotion um for me anyway that doesn't really sell the 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 right type of overwhelm. There's just some weird little moments of like unintended comedy in that first movie that I just yeah did not feel at all in part two. It just yeah feels way more polished. Like they had mm -hmm. just more of a structure, more maybe more time to storyboard this or get this together. Because like yeah, the first time they use the that the vocals in that main theme, I think it's with that really well timed action sequence where the they're taking out some of the oil well, sorry, spice uh, mines or whatever, and there's like a ornithopter crash in the background that's like timed with the score kicking in. It's like this really cool action moment early on. Um, mm -hmm. And it just felt like, yeah, this is this is hitting how I feel like it's it was intended instead of the odd miss in that first part. Um, yeah, I appreciate that about it. It seemed like they really were on a roll. The uh, the sound design was incredible, mm -hmm. and I also thought so for part one. Really, uh, that was one of my. Favorite I think it's parts yeah, really one. good in both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially with the Harkonnens and whatnot. The in part one, the Baron's like technology that keeps him flying in the air has this like really deep rumble and like timber mm. as it activates. And it's like, oh, this is. Yeah, really engrossing, especially when you've got like a good sound system and you're hearing it like crackle yeah. all around you. It's like, oh, this is this is the good stuff right here. And the same with like the worms and whatnot, the the noises that emphasize its the scale of them and whatnot, you know, as they click and echo. Yeah. Love all that stuff. Yeah, I uh there's a couple things I want to compare to nineteen eighty four. So if you don't have anything else to say about Dune Part Two. I'd like to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Let's get into it. Um, do you want to do your rating for Part Two, and then I'll wrap I up? I do. I'm giving this one a seven out of ten. Mm. Still, I'm not like a. I don't know. It's <laughs> this is this is like one of the better case scenarios for a Star Wars type film for me. You know. Mm. Still. <laughs> Still not a Star Wars type film person, but really great stuff in here. 
Yeah. Well, I'm obviously as more of a Star Wars type film person. Yeah, this is right up my alley. Um, it's kind of. Yeah, I, I I don't feel like an asshole for the like the caveats. It's mm-hmm. like nice when you have like <laughs> when the caveats are met, and it lives up to the premise of like, no, we got you. We've want to split into part into two parts. At the end of part two, you feel like it was justified. It makes sense. I feel like it was the best way to do the story justice, especially after watching that eighty four one again. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, with how complicated and heady and all over the place some of the concepts are, just with how they managed to do that in the five and a half hours, part one and two, I think is like really, really good stuff. Uh, Really fantastic, consistent sci-fi storytelling that I just want to be seeing. Um, I'm so glad people are responding because, I don't know, this, this seems like the exact kind of thing that Nerds would go out and like and see, but no one else would, um, and it would just bomb. I'd just be one of those. Oh, man, imagine if we could have got part two of Dune type situations. Yeah. But no, here we are. We actually, we actually got it, and it delivered. And I just think he's a really consistent filmmaker. Like his last four films are like these really solid science fiction blockbusters of different scales, different moods, different tones. Like uh, I think that's really cool. Um, a really valuable voice in the space right now. Hell yeah, he is a he's a very sought after director, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, he's got like, like he's three a big or four name now. projects already green lit and yeah. like ready to go. Um, did I say my score? Yeah, like a high uh, four star or eight out of ten. That possibly could go up on rewatch. Or wow, see it again in the next week or two. It's so close yeah, to yeah. part one. Hmm. Well, I feel like the. They are so, they are very similar at the end of the day. Cause might as well be one movie to you. They might as well be one yeah, thing because they are. I feel that way about Kill Bill. Part two just kind of gets the advantage of having some of the best set pieces and most interesting part of the story. It gets the real meat of the novel to play with. So it kind of mm-hmm. has that inherent advantage. So yeah, uh, it probably will be. So I, I would say it's slightly better than that first one, but I, I really can't. Yeah, I do just see it as one, as you were saying. I would say I would say Dune Part Two is the first movie I felt in a long time can actually be called epic without it being ironic. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. the The whole set piece towards the end with the three worms and whatnot. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. This is. This is earned scale because you just see you, you get like dull to it at a certain point when you see enough like big spectacle Hollywood movies like the Meg or whatever you know, or like this new Godzilla that's coming out like the the spectacle and scale like, just epic. doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah, with the whole thing, it's just like yeah, this epic image and this epic image and did They're we mention this now. epicness that's coming? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where like there's there's nothing behind it. Uh, whereas, yeah, this feels like it feels earned. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like when when you get to it, and it, and it makes the sweetness that much sweeter when it actually is earned, instead of this like yeah hollow, like quick crash that you get from the the easiness of Godzilla punching Kong in the head, whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, don't I know. heard they're gonna kiss in the new movie. <laughs> I hope that they better do. That's basically the promise. That. <laughs> <laughs> Dune 1984, directed by David Lynch. And yeah. he also did the screenplay. Ambitious, I guess we can give it that. It was um very funny. <laughs> it was very it was a very <laughs> funny film. You mentioned the the sound of like the flying baron or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I just I <laughs> in this movie <laughs> in this movie he's like the Eggman, like Sonic. And he's like <laughs> yeah, he is. when he's like flying around, he's got a very funny, like high pitched, like <laughs> like kind of noise. He's constantly flying and constantly screaming. He's got a diseased face. 
<laughs> yeah, he's like covered in pustules. There's that scene where he, <laughs> the scene starts and he's just like flying around this pillar in circles while screaming. And, it, and it's never really addressed, but that's just kind of what he's like, I guess. Ah! Yeah, a lot of flying, bobbing, and screaming. And it's like, <laughs> well, it's, it's so imposing and, and frightening and scary when the the one in the Villeneuve, and that, that Baron is like a imposing his imagery but this guy he's like a clown <laughs> he's like the opposite of scary he's just kind of gross mm-hmm. like that's as intimidating as he gets as he's just yeah he's got like goo all over him and his postules are getting injected with by the Harkonnen doctors and all, all this goofiness but <laughs> yeah it's never intimidating that's for sure they're not no. a very threatening villainous force in fact like the 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 plot of the film is it's like incomprehensible at a certain part. There's <laughs> it like rushes through the the best of moments, I guess, of that, that first Dune book. And like when I say rushes through, it is it is taking no time. It is like <laughs> it is terrified to linger for even a couple minutes. It's mm-hmm. it's got so much to cover. It's like a, it's the it's the it's the nightmare scenario, of, I guess, if like Villeneuve had to cram that one book into one film. Like, yeah, he might not have done it. This might be a little taste. Yeah, this might be a little taste of like some of the pitfalls that come with that because you just have so much to explain, as I was saying, like the all those concepts, all of these ideas, and the the solution that I guess Lynch came up with for the most part was to just stop the film entirely and just have them talk at the camera. That's yes. kind of the solution. <laughs> like the first twenty minutes of the movie is like no exaggeration, just comp- just exposition dump nonstop. Like there there aren't really characters talking to each other. It's just straight up exposition, like down to having a floating head in space talking at the audience. Who forgets like, what she was going to say about a minute into it? <laughs> yeah. She fades out and then says. Oh wait, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> and then comes <laughs> I <almost> forgot, yeah. <laughs> Which is a great line. I love I love that moment. That was fun. Yeah, we got a you know, it I I found this movie like very entertaining. I found it like a really easy film mm-hmm. to get through. I was laughing at it. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I like I like it mostly because <laughs> of how just strange this is in David Lynch's filmography. Like it, it really stands out <laughs> as a, and he's like written it off and like doesn't really want to talk about it. And there, are, there are a couple of funny like clips on YouTube of him like just straight up referring to it as a failure and whatnot. And I mm. think there's some um, well, it takes balls to do that, like to acknowledge that that it didn't work out. It's not the first time that a big studio sci-fi project has wound up not coming together for the director. I guess a, a tale as old as time, really. Yeah. Um, I don't really, don't really blame him for that. Uh, as fu- as funny as it does come together, um, but yeah, it's it's just it's it's an impossible ask almost. Like adapting it in the eighties as well. Like mm-hmm. forget about it's it's a challenge in the in contemporary times now. Like with the visual effects we have, we're still picking apart some of that, let alone in the 80s and the scale of what they had to try and sell, uh, obviously does not work out. It's almost like condescending at a certain point with like how how lacking in confidence the the story has in itself, like stopping every two seconds to make sure the audience is, is keeping up with the concepts that are at play or something that's going on and just this over-reliance on narration all the time. It's like ASMR whispering narration that's always going on incessantly. Um, if there's kind of two approaches uh, with like the Villeneuve Dune one, the two-part approach he took of kind of leaving some things open or interpretable to the audience uh, that you can kind of fill in with book knowledge and just choosing not to linger on mm-hmm. the hows and whys of things. The Dune 84 does like the complete inverse of that. Like you just, you, all you gotta do is just compare like an equivalent scene, like the Bene Gesserit box scene, uh, 
and just the execution of the the showing the hand, yeah, yeah, like showing the hand burning while there's like this narration going over the all the imagery, and it's like just repeated again and again. Ah, uh, yes, you can see that the hand is burning here. <laughs> Where yeah, I think, yeah, yeah I, I think the correct approach is use the imagination because then that leaves the audience members to fill in the blanks themselves and have it, you know, just whatever to them is the most painful thing imaginable. Yeah. Yeah. It's more effective that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes you, yeah, connect with the character more and the world and get engaged with it instead of like, it's always putting you at an arm's length and making itself really distant and difficult to understand especially when like what like 70 percent of it looks stupid and ridiculous oh like, yeah like uh, like that like uh, <laughs> i was making fun of the how the shields look in part one like the <laughs> what even the, what, what roblox. was roblox the... it's a roblox type fight scene <laughs> yeah it does they just turn into roblox and it, it, it covers the characters in such a way that it, it literally fills the entire frame yeah like, with the vis with the visual effects layered on top of it you can't see anything <laughs> it's just yeah like they blocks. have to be like thick enough that you know the, it's less polygons the less <laughs> hinges yeah. there are so with the limitations at the time, but even even so, even considering those limitations, they didn't exactly film it in a smart way. Yeah, it doesn't seem like they planned for it. No, yeah, it, it almost seems like they added it like as an afterthought. Because because there's some shots where, if I were to imagine it being filmed without those effects, you might be able to interpret. You know, someone flying across the screen is like, oh, they're lunging or they're jumping yeah, or something. Yeah. But in this, when it when there's so much covering it, and it's just the one shot, it it just looks like they they gain the ability to fly for a second, and I'm like, what? And then I have to like try and piece <laughs> together like what the intent might have been for what they were showing, not yeah. properly communicated, not properly communicated, and everything's like really low energy as well like there's there's no uh like urgency to anything <laughs> it's like every, everyone's sleepwalking through this there's no like excitement it's yeah very sleepy like plodding kind of movement to everything i like at the it. same time that it is like well the I, I find it entertaining. It's like, but it, it is bad. Like, it, yeah. you don't connect with anyone. It's 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 like simultaneously cold and distant, but also moves so quickly. And like, it's just mm -hmm. going beat by beat by beat. Like, and you're never given a second to like absorb anything or take anything in while it's just like screaming concepts at you. Like I mentioned in the intro, the, the tooth thing. That's another good contrast point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he like farts one. out his fucking mouth. <laughs> yeah yeah and the whole setup is like they explain it and it's like I put the fake tooth in and then you gotta have the little remember reminder remember the tooth remember the tooth you gotta remember the tooth <laughs> yeah it's like oh, what yeah. how stupid do you think I am remember like I've got a bad short term tooth. memory but <laughs> yeah how stupid do you think I am man yeah that, w that was something that was not difficult to understand in the first film no. In, as in the part one. It's really not complicated. Like, there are way more complicated concepts going on that they, like, breeze over compared mm -hmm. to this tooth <laughs> for, for some reason. You gotta remember the tooth. I like, what, I, they, I like that they called the martial arts thing the weirding way. I don't know if that was in the book or not, but I don't remember yeah, I don't them saying that in the, book, but in I, the Villeneuve version. I noted that down, too. The yeah, weirding that way. weird scene where he, like, explodes the obelisk or something. Yeah. Where he does it like a fusto ra or a kamehameha. Yeah. <laughs> she saw. Yeah, I, I'm sure. That, yeah, I'm sure it is something to do with the book. And then having all of them do that, <laughs> like in the end fight scene, just like he saw, he saw. Like every single one, <laughs> like fucking dozens of characters all just shouting this weird thing is just funny to me. And it's so weird because like they they're using like guns, but they're building it up with their yeah. own weirding way powers that he had to teach them. <laughs> That's a little confusing. 
a little bizarre, but like it's 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 hitting the beats on a checklist in a way where oh yeah exactly because yeah, yeah that last like 50 minutes is basically boiling down what in doom part two makes up two hours 46 minutes into like yeah 50 minutes and it's like just going going it's rushing through that at the speed of light and obviously never gets a chance to delve into any of it in much detail or mm -hmm. give it any resonance um, and especially with some of the <laughs> the aspects that have definitely aged it and uh, cemented it in the eighties, like the the score, especially that. Uh, I like the score. I like again. I like the score. I like the score, but I don't think it would be the correct choice to. I don't think of a, a sci-fi setting thousands of years outside of my own i think of the 80s correct i think of the music from this whereas <laughs> like the music in doom part one and two i feel like is more uh you know it complements the it feels timeless like it would exist outside of anything we would know instead of it's literally like brian eno and a guitar well <laughs> so i love brian eno i'm a brian eno guy but like you know it is funny let's wait another 20 to 40 years before we definitively say that the music doesn't feel dated though yeah because we we'll could we, we could see that like the those sounds of, of like more of that decade the decade that we're in right now you know it's yeah still on the table um i just yeah i don't know i i find it difficult to put it on the same level of, uh, as, as campiness mm, of campiness yeah. that, that this film reaches uh, and it's like there was a certain scene where I I still don't really understand like what even was going on. I was hoping it hoping maybe you had an inter interpretation of it where like the there's the, like the eraser head babies like flying around mm. space like shooting goo light at planets. Um, and it's like this whole sequence, and I was just like, what the. F like what is actually happening? Like, couldn't tell you. I, I don't even know. <laughs> like, I have no clue. <laughs> like, what the, like the holes, and that's before they've even got to Arrakis, I think. Because I know, like, just after that, I noted down that there's a there's an establishing shot of Arrakis with a <laughs> like a mothership hovering above it, and the the mothership looks like it looks like shit. Like it looks it looks awful. Um, <laughs> Like some of the map paintings and the miniatures, like they look really good and kind of stuff I like, but some of it's like, man, this is rushed. You had like, what re what resources did you have for this? Because uh, it's really not selling some of the the scope you got to communicate here. Like with with some of the worm scenes as well. Uh, I, I quite like the design of the worms, but when it comes to you know the equivalent scene of Paul having to ride the mega worm it's like it's like comical yeah that that like, was it really looks, funny it looks ridiculous that was, that was a very bad looking <laughs> sequence and even even like for the time <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah yeah you can see the blue outline on every character like damn yeah some really bad compositing the, the uh, blue screen technology was not not quite there yet or yeah, was well, look, it's like a it's like a mad fever dream by that point in the film anyway. Because when it gets into the whole like war and there's like this weightless floaty action where there's just like projectiles going everywhere, filling the screen with motion, but it's like nothing's actually happening. It's like and this tri triumphant music is playing and people are screaming and you're like. Oh my god! What is even being accomplished? I don't even know. Like, what is happening? Like, oh, it's so mad, um, but weirdly entertaining. Yeah, it is. It is a weirding way type film. <laughs> it's um, definitely weirding way. Yeah, David Lynch mastered the weirding way. I like it because it reminds I, me of like Ralph Bakshi shit. You know, I love seeing uh, this. Yeah, like old technology just dated and the tone and you know just things that are not necessarily they're, they're not at all like seamless or like expertly no. crafted but they have so much character to it 
I like things with, uh, you know, scars and wrinkles or like all these, all yeah. these imperfections, but are just still amusing to, to Yeah, it, it does feel like kind of like misplaced character. Like some of the, some of the costume designs and like hairstyles and whatnot. The eyebrows. <laughs> the <laughs> yeah, the eyebrows, the big poofy hair. Yeah, lots of like goofy decisions, which I don't know. I I like the the obvious Lynch nature to them, but when you're trying to do this like novel justice, it really it really is quite funny how a, a lot of it comes together and how just confusing and mm -hmm. all over the place. Or like just comparing the dragonfly ships from the Villeneuve uh, parts compared to whatever that thing was. It looked like a teacup. They were like flying around mm. for the equivalent scenes. <laughs> really weird visual language they were pulling out uh, for like establishing the factions and the ships and it's just like it's not it's not it's not interesting or cool in the way that it's intended. It's just kind of like weird um in a lynchian way uh which is kind of half intended but it's also supposed to be dune <laughs> yeah it's definitely a weirding <laughs> way <laughs> all of the acting was bad like, yeah what was with like some of the emphasis and a lot of the acting like some of the lines they just deliver with like as if they were directed this is the most important thing you've ever said or done or like you'll break down after you say this line like when, when the worm leaves when paul and his mother are like they're hiding in the rocks and there's these big and there's a worm like slamming on the rocks trying to get to them and then it leaves she has she has the line, why did it leave? Mm -hmm. But she delivers it like in the most intense, extreme way, and then she like breaks down like sobbing. And then it cuts away to a pool line and back to her, and then she just delivers the next line in a completely different cadence, as if she wasn't just like breaking down. And so there's so so many weird, hilarious reads like that. They're just like, oh, none of this is gelling all of these random takes and like different levels of intensity and like actors clearly not knowing what they're channeling and it's man, it's like all over the place and yeah, it is funny, but man, it is, it is not land. Mm hmm. Yeah. A lot of great lines. I want to spit once on your head. <laughs> Just a little <laughs> spittle. <laughs> <laughs> I like when he said the worm is the spice and the spice is the worm and then he just like screams. Lots of screaming. <laughs> like just that oh, emphasis yeah. is always just something. Like, ah! He was a great character. Fantastic <laughs> screen presence. <laughs> Scream presence, yeah. Yes. I like when uh Paul gets his name. It's like, what is the name of the thing? It is Mwadib. I wish to be called Paul. Mwadib, you are Paul Mwadib. Just the, the awkwardness of that conversation, <laughs> just the back and forth was just so good. Oh, there's lots of like awkwardness, like stilted awkwardness with it feels like no one even knows like the words they're saying. Like they they yeah, know nothing about Dune. They know nothing about like how this all links together. They're just saying just these reading things. Reading phonetically. Like, like the way they say and I don't know if it, what the like proper quote unquote way to say Harkonnens is, but like they're all saying it in like these weird different ways. Like some were saying like Harkonnens, it's the Harkonnens. Some were saying Harkonnens. It's like, wait, come on, I've, what is it? <laughs> mm. I thought the with the awkward like creepy interactions the. The ultimate awkward interaction was that of between Paul and his dad. It was like mm -hmm. really weird. The like I'm so proud of you scene, and it just like holds on a close up of his dad's face, just like staring lovingly for like it feels like mm -hmm. a full minute, like just <laughs> holding it there. It's like so awkward. Like why? <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, pff, fucking, I just. The the acting is so bad. Like Kyle McLaughlin 
when he's pretending to sleep, it's like maybe the worst I've ever seen in a movie ever. <laughs> Desert planet. Oh. He's like talking in his sleep. And then Sting, who <laughs> I was not <laughs> ever that familiar with, but uh, his entire screen presence, just this weird fucking, like he shows up <laughs> in the vision or I, I guess, I, I don't even know the context of what's happening. He just says like, I will kill you. And then, <laughs> like, ev yeah, every single scene he's in, he's doing, like, this weird shit with his eyebrows, like, all these weird, almost like Tim and Eric-style facial <laughs> yeah, expressions. Yeah. I'm like, oh, you don't know that you're doing that, do you? Like, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you're just kind of in the movie. <laughs> yeah, that's a really bad character. But basically, <laughs> every line read from Sting is, like, hilarious and yeah uh, wrong <laughs> <laughs> wrong <laughs> yeah it's like it doesn't it's not right <laughs> yeah uh lots of pugs in the movie Don't yeah they even why. took a pug into battle yeah why like, right as the battle begins <laughs> like uh, <laughs> patrick stewart's like holding one <laughs> as he charges into war i don't know why <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> it's a metaphor for just how how like you like how dogs get selectively bred until you know people are like oh so cute and but their faces are crushed oh, like the Benny Jesuit. and they have like breathing problems and they're constantly in pain and their eyes are popping out but people are like oh it's cute that's like what happened to the movie from the studios. Mm. It's a very smart metaphor from David Lynch. It's a eugenics, yeah, it's a eugenics failure. Yeah, um, and his, it, it, I, f I felt that way about the visual metaphor of his his cameo appearance as well when he's like, oh yeah, <laughs> the struggling worker in the in in the mining machine that's about to be like destroyed by a giant worm that's rocketing towards him, while he's like in the depths of this machine covered in grease, like <laughs> trying to hold it together. Um, I thought, yeah, that was quite a good visual depiction of probably what he was going through making this this film. The number of the day. He's, just got, a, he's got a funny voice. Oh, he's got a great <laughs> voice. <laughs> the weather report. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there are some things I liked about it. Um, I thought that, there, you know, that creature that shows up, the garbage bag people kind of bring into the room, it was like kind of Cronenberg-y. There's some cool practical effects stuff going on here and there. But yeah, it, it it really gets overshadowed by just how much improperly realized <laughs> material is, is in the, the film, both character and narratively and, and visually and effects and all, like just so much of it just is laughable. But it made it fun. <laughs> it made it a fun <laughs> movie for me. <laughs> I love Eggman. He's the best. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is my second time seeing this, and I was, yeah, just as entertained. Um, partially through kind of how baffled you are. It's especially funny after seeing part one, two of Villeneuve's <laughs> version yeah like. it's it's extra embarrassing <laughs> yeah the worm riding scene especially i'm like <laughs> yeah, whoa yeah, yeah. <laughs> well even like i don't know simple simple scenes that don't even require much or many visual effects like the the scene where they try on the the fremen suits and pulls mm. one already fits like really well just like the way it's blocked and like the yeah. awkward like just delivery of it and it's all just like so confusing and the, the the way space is depicted too yeah like that's one of the things i like about how how like long the runtime of part one is where you really get like a good idea of the whole mining facility the where everything's like laid out where scenes are taking place whereas like here i know paul he's like in a hallway of some somewhere and you're like I don't even know where you are or like why this environment's important or anything. It's all just like so random and just jumps about 
it's yeah, just seemingly random ways that don't link together. It's uh, it's it's pretty broken in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, loads about visual effects, loads about dialogue. Even if it is trying to translate concepts that are cool on the written page and cool in the Villeneuve adaptations, but here are just just so dumb. Like the voice, like sucks. It's just yes. not cool the way it's, it it manifests in this film. <laughs> like it's mostly just used for people to just talk at the audience. Really, yes. Like they don't really do anything with it. They just really kind of slowly baby. make each other walk around. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at earlier with when that fetus with the thousands of years of knowledge is born, it's supposed to be put into a little girl, and you get it in the Lynch one. And uh, hmm. I mean, they <laughs> what a payoff! They do, <laughs> yeah, exactly. They do something with it. They, uh, she's the one who kills the Baron, I think, in the book and in. This mm -hmm. version of the movie, which kind of makes, yeah, I know, as I say, it happens in the book, but it, it just leaves Paul as kind of this, <laughs> just has like no agency in the in this version. He just, I don't know. He just kind of goes around doing what he does because he has to. It doesn't feel like yeah, he has any agency. He's just, yep going through this weird world, things are happening because they're happening, and there are fetuses flying through space, shooting light beams that shit. Like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't know, I actually know what happens now, like, in the story. Uh, a lot of gross things. A lot of body horror happened for some reason. Yeah, it seemed like that's the part Lynch enjoyed, was the Harkonnen. Mm-hmm grossness and everything outside of that is a bit just like uh ripping a cow's tongue off and eating it and just chewing it throughout the scene like om nom 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 <laughs> like, that was weird <laughs> they, yeah they, they all had they had like red hair and chapped lips and some like really weird yeah. they were all diseased as far as yeah <laughs> someone someone's interpretation of this I'm not gonna like try and pretend like I have any idea how legitimate this is but there's a film scholar in the 1980s that said that this film was the most obscenely homophilm homophobic film I have ever seen it was the quote um oh apparently you know just a bunch of apparently they considered the villains to be like queer coded and like diseased in the middle of the AIDS epidemic and Oh I'm shit! Reading this thing here, referring to a scene in which Baron Harkonnen sexually assaults and kills a young man by bleeding him to death, charging him with a yeah. So, I didn't I didn't do like a huge dive into this. I kind of just loosely heard about mm. it, but I don't know who who knows. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about it now. How yeah? Because like yeah. in the books, are they a bunch of diseased? <laughs> I think they're like they're sex perverts, but I don't, I don't know if they're like have like boils on them and, mm. and that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. Who knows? Well, let's get Lynch on the show and ask him. All right, we're getting David Lynch on the show. <laughs> well, I did watch on my phone, so. Uh, yeah, you did. Yeah, of course. It's the only way I watched this one. I wonder if he'd be okay with you watching this film on your phone. It's, yeah, it's the only film from his uh, filmography he allows mm. on the phone. Yeah, on your telephone. <laughs> All right. Um, I give this one a 4 out of 10. I loved it. It was very funny. Eggman was funny. I will never forget Eggman. Roblox is Yeah. <laughs> I uh I I had it down on Letterboxd as the same rating, two two star four out of ten. Uh, it's very bad from almost every angle, but kind of yeah, kind of fun bad. I'm consistently laughing at some of the decisions. A lot of effort did go in to making it, but it's like all kind of misplaced. <laughs> Yeah, the, all of it. It never comes together in any way. There's like no good action. There's there are a lot of like 
sets and scale and different capable actors and these costumes and wackiness. But yeah, it's all just a bit, a bit off, I'm afraid. Uh, just a yeah, strange, strange director for for this. Um, I know George Lucas asked him as well to do a Star Wars movie, and that maybe is a glimpse into what that might have been like as well. But uh, yeah, it wasn't Lynch that was able to translate this on the big screen, that's for sure. All right, to freedom is a film that I recommended. Uh, we found this film, and I think most people actually found this film because they were looking for Sound of Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed that I, I looked this up on Letterboxd af after, and that's what a lot of the reviews said, <laughs> is, that, is that they were looking for Sound of Freedom and found To Freedom 2023. Really? I'm amazed it had a lot of reviews. Like uh, more than three. Well, a three. There were three total. There were three total. <laughs> I mean, okay. A, the a, a significant portion of the existing reviews state okay. <laughs> stated that. Yeah, because this has what a hundred ratings on IMDb. It was under a hundred, and then I did a watch along. And now it's over a hundred. It was like ninety <laughs> something. Now there's a hundred eleven ratings. Now everyone's watching to freedom. Yeah, we get to see the the power <laughs> of my watch along <laughs> at least 20 people <laughs> rated it <laughs> it's all right let's read the description on yeah. imdb a what grieving <laughs> widower mourning the loss of his wife realizes a year later everything is not what it seems <laughs> uh this is from director bioden steven and writer tiger mm. fire rose um, something that I noticed is that Mr. Steven, the director, directed, I think, 18 other movies in 2023. Yeah, I counted 14. <laughs> hey, let's see. In one year, yeah. 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 Which explains a lot. That's including TV. Must have a very efficient uh, system. Yeah. Yeah. Because there were a bunch of times where I was thinking something like, you know, if the audio didn't work that day, you could just do ADR. But I guess he was already <laughs> working on 10 other movies. <laughs> yeah. And they, that, that was just, there is no post, maybe. <laughs> maybe that's the whole <laughs> style of directing. Well, it, the audio sounded like they forgot to take like a, a cap off something. Or it sounded like it had a yeah. cover. <laughs> yeah, it was muffled. It was either muffled or peaking. And there was, you know, sometimes yeah. they would hit that perfect spot in between where it sounded like a normal mic for seconds. And then we would never hear yeah. that until like 20 minutes later. For a yeah. couple of seconds. Or the most frustrating one is when there would be dialogue in a scene that sounds muffled and like it's two miles away in the distance. At the same time as there being like the sound effect of someone playing with a pen or like, crickets, clear as day, <laughs> or crickets, yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> in the same scene, the obviously different crew that was doing like the foley and background effects, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or uh, maybe it was just like stock effects for some of these things, like crickets or whatever. Oh my god, in the middle of that dinner scene where the character Adam <laughs> shows up and shows the picture <laughs> on his phone. And just all of the audio is just absolutely fucking horrendous. It, like you <laughs> never heard any worse audio from any other film ever, probably. Like Birdemic's the only one that comes close. But this yeah, might yeah. be worse. And then just like the his date at the table takes a sip. And they did they actually did the the foley of the sip. And it's clear as day, like <laughs> in the middle yeah, of yeah. the scene where like you can't hear what they're saying. <laughs> or like the rain sound effects. Where it's like, okay, wait, they're indoors. Why is the rain like 10 times as loud as them speaking? <laughs> oh my God. What a gem. What a what a fucking classic this was. Because there are some movies where you can just tell. <laughs> yeah, it was hilarious. This, this was a movie where I, I skimmed through a little bit and I went, this isn't Sound of Freedom, but it's stuck in my memory. And I was like, there's yeah, something that yeah. imprinted on me. I'm like, there's something special here. And I am intrigued, and I gotta check this out. 
and I am not disappointed. I had that, yeah, I had that exact same experience when I was looking for Sound of Freedom. And yeah, normally if I was if I was Rick rolled that hard and was was given something like this, yeah, I would just delete it and not give it the time of day. But something about it made it so I just, I just kept it. I, d- I didn't have the heart to get rid of it. I knew there'd be so- yeah, <laughs> there was space in my future for to free. <laughs> no, we we knew we would make time for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it demanded it. <laughs> it really, yeah. It, it, there's something about it where it where it begs. It, it it commands some sort of presence. It 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 uh, is begging for interpretation. You know, like Synecdoche in New York. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like someone watched Gone Girl and was like, "Oh yeah." My turn. <laughs> spoilers for Gone Girl is what I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Spoilers for Gone Girl for this discussion because uh, it's a ripoff of Gone Girl. <laughs> Even down to like the music and stuff. They're trying oh, yeah. to do the like Trent Reznor score and everything. Very clearly <laughs> trying to emulate the the Gone Girl soundtrack in specific scenes. Yeah, even even down to the the famous technically missing scene from Gone Girl, they like tried to do that but flip it. <laughs> like <laughs> for yeah. most of the movie you're following this this lead <laughs> main character whose yeah wife has gone missing. And yeah, just towards the end they they try to act like they're pulling the rug out and it's like he was actually an abuser the whole time. It's he like, just this forgot is the moment. Yeah, he just forgot. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's that's probably why she's ran away. Yeah. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, he's like acting in earnest, like, I actually have no clue where she's gone. Like, yeah. Even though she said know. she would leave in the flashbacks, he like <laughs> caught her trying to leave once. She's like, I'm not going anywhere. He's like, I, yes, you are. I'm going to hit you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, unfortunately, because of that audio, it made some of it quite difficult. To decipher, I had I subtitles. Found, like you didn't have subtitles. Oh, really? The one I had didn't have subtitles. Oh, no. Oh God, you had a very different experience than I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it was like yeah, trying to solve something. Um, well, you you got to fill me in then on the there's this best friend character to the abusive yes. main character, who ha- kind of breaks down towards the end and he's like, not this time, and he tells this story about how the was it the main character yeah. loved someone to death? Yes, exactly. So, so he has a history <laughs> of like killing his girlfriends because he's so abusive. So, like, this isn't the first time the main the main character. This is not this is not his first rodeo. Uh, and the best friend, I guess, is like I, I don't know if he's a friend under duress because the guy's so powerful. Yeah. That if anybody tries to arrest him, he pulls the Uno reverse card, and and they the police wait patiently while he makes a phone call to their boss and says, "Actually, the person who tried to arrest me is under arrest." So the friend ca- couldn't do anything about it w- uh, unless he was doing things behind his back, basically, which is what wound up happening. So the friend, his best friend, helped the main character's girlfriend escape but not really because she stayed in t- not only in town but at her parents house and they invited him over for the funeral to the same place where she <laughs> was without putting her somewhere else without saying hey maybe take the day in a different location this man that's trying to hunt you down and basically kill you and this abuser mm-hmm. is going to be here and then she looks out the window at the exact moment where he's looking and she's like oh no he was looking and then she hides under the bed <laughs> Well, not under the bed, on the floor <laughs> with the covers draped over her. Yeah, not not um, in plain sight. Yeah, not properly thought through from the characters. You know, but, yeah, the whole movie. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the but best friend couldn't really do much because the guy's so powerful. Even though I thought the best friend like employed him, so shouldn't he also be more powerful? Because <laughs> like he's employing him, yeah, he's they like didn't, they, they didn't really elaborate on the power levels. Yeah, what does but... he even do for work? Like he just makes. They money. never said. I don't think he like talks with banks or something. Like he was always just wearing like uh, fly outfits and whatnot, and like the costume design. Then... Holy shit! <laughs> Insane. It's like so distracting. You like can't focus it's on nuts. anything. So you're like, right. you're wearing like the most elaborate. Like I don't even know what that is. It's like the most colorful, amazing thing you've ever seen. It's crazy. Like, you can't focus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you're being peacocked in every frame of the film. True, true. 
I like there's there's a part where he like quickly rushes to like put on his sandals, but they're too small for him. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> his feet are like way bigger than the sandals, and it, they continue the scene anyway. And you see it. <laughs> But man, this film does not pull its punches. Like once it is revealed that the main character is like an abuser, and the other characters band together to deal with him, the, the solution is to like get him on a drug cocktail. And um, well, I wrote down the exact phrasing. Let's just say he's in the prison of his own mind. Is the phrasing yes. that they they settle on so that <laughs> that's their solution is to get him into a, a drug induced stupor so he won't hurt anyone again so he can and then, of course it's... sign her release <laughs> or what was happening is it... so he could sign i don't is that is that the release or a divorce or I don't... uh so I don't she know. can like leave the country i guess i guess but then he eventually figures it out as in, he learns how to spit out the medication because he's not being injected. He's just kind of willfully taking these pills. <laughs> and he was even suspicious at the beginning. He's like, wait, these are different. They're like, no, we we switched from generic brand to the name brand. It's better. <laughs> it's the better medication, not the same chemical, but better. I just, I just love how they have the whole like conquering over this guy and managing to escape like that's what the name is getting at to freedom Woo! is indicating the the freedom of this woman but it, <laughs> but it ends on the the psycho main guy like basically looking into the camera and saying i'm coming for you hell yeah i like i hope there's a sequel <laughs> yeah to freedom too let's go let's make this bioden steven's most successful film so he's <laughs> obligated to make a sequel <laughs> See, cool. I'll fucking watch. Whole, it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll fucking watch yeah. it in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, turn this guy into like an unkillable, like Freddy type. Oh my god, figure. You know, you could have his whole whole franchise. It was so weird because at the like the very beginning of the movie, they have that the the title and just the design of the title, single fucking PNG image of a flame on one of the letters. I think the. <laughs> not moving i'm like okay that's weird and then they do the whole like glitch effect like <laughs> i'm like wait is this a scary movie <laughs> i thought this was like a like a character ro romantic that like you know you read the description you see the poster yeah yeah just like kind of hugging and people are staring blankly into the distance no, it's, it's a thriller <laughs> i guess with twists <laughs> it's a gone girl type film you know, I, I once saw a tweet. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was, oh my God. Classic line. The best line in the whole film. Uh, yeah, it's reminding because so I was like, there's no, he, he must have said something else. No. <laughs> tweet. He must have said so another word that sounds like tweet. No, but you know, I once saw a tweet. <laughs> I couldn't imagine watching this without subtitles. I'm so sorry. Oh, it, it was kind of a fun challenge it was like a chess <laughs> game in and of itself trying to like figure out like, it really forces you to pay attention <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh like yeah engrossed. maybe you can help me then on that scene early on where the wife has gone missing and the main character is like he's talking to people who you you think are cops who are like investigating or yeah. trying to find the body or whatever but then he's like what, what am i paying you guys for go find her and it's like wait what i think he hired a <laughs> duo of private investigators that he forgot about after that scene because the entire rest of the movie i was like why don't you just like you found a clue you believe you found a clue if i can give that like all of this it's a weird extreme version of like tell don't show <laughs> you know mm. Because he he says he sees her in the window. We never see that until later. And I, from if I'm trying to imagine the choice to not show his perspective there, I would think, okay, well, they're afraid of showing her being there because they don't want the audience to know whether or not she was there. But you could still show it from his perspective and just show it quickly enough or... You you know there, plenty of films have done that where like you still don't know because you don't know if that was just from his perspective. You don't know if that was like a hallucination yeah. from him. You can still show it. It chose not to. Fucking the scene I was talking about earlier. Adam shows up and you know shows him a picture on his phone. Like, 
oh, this is her. And then he like accuses him of kidnapping her. He's like, where'd you take her? And then his date's like, wait, you're married? He's like, no, yes, no. <laughs> we never see the picture. We just, we see him reacting to the picture. We never see it, right? All of these things, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. okay, show the private investigators. Tell them what you know now. If you really want to find her, then you should be updating them. <laughs> Why did they, di those characters just disappeared. It's crazy that the script got finished and forgot that they wrote those characters in at the beginning and then just... It's crazy that it has a script. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. I just love that main that main character, his his facial expressions that he's whipping out throughout the, <laughs> throughout the Very film. Very so awesome. The way, the way they hold on them, especially whatever he was doing with his like, eyebrows. Like that serious face he kept doing. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was like cracking up every time he was doing it. Yeah. Oh, and it like really lingers. Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> the chef's kiss right there. <laughs> yeah, the action scenes, the fight scenes. She's dead. She's alive. <laughs> <laughs> Towards the beginning, they, they like, they, they attempt to time lapse <laughs> for, for like... They clearly didn't film enough like raw footage to speed up, so it goes by like way too quick, like way too fast for a time lapse. Also, it wasn't stationary; it was fucking moving around. <laughs> no, yeah, you yeah, should you should yeah, get yeah, it yeah. on a tripod and keep it there and don't touch it. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> if you're gonna speed up the footage, oh my god, that same shot of like the <laughs> the office building or whatever from below looking up that they use like three different times and like <laughs> yeah. almost every time it's like two seconds too short. It like doesn't leave any breathing room. Like the editing is just so weird where it's like, Bop! And like, Oh wait, did I just see that shot? Why, why was it so quick? Why was that yeah. there? Yeah. They do that a bunch of times. No understanding of, yeah. of like pacing at yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really crazy <laughs> that, that they decided to do this type of story and present it in this way because you know, even if you were just copying Gone Girl, you can make something interesting out of, oh, wife is missing, right? You can you can have mm -hmm. more clues throughout the film to keep people engaged. But instead, it's like 45 minutes in a row, at least, of him just being like, I'm crazy and sad. And like nothing new gets developed. He, it's just very repetitive. And it doesn't really move <laughs> on. Like you could be, you could be finding out new things. <laughs> yeah, it's just the same repeat of him going somewhere, finding out that something's not right, doing the funny face, and then screaming at someone about like, "Where's my wife? Where have you put my wife?" <laughs> <laughs> and it's just that again and again. Yeah, that in the in the like three or four locations <laughs> on the on the obvious on the obvious sound stages. Yeah, that they are. Jumping between. My God. <laughs> Overly lit. The parents' house. I don't know if you caught this. The fucking railing was like not. That that was like a safety hazard. It was like fucking wobbling. <laughs> I didn't notice. When they were touching it. And there's a shot where like <laughs> when they get to the top of the stairs and he's like they're, the dad's like confronting him or whatever. And every time it cuts back to the main character, the only other thing in the frame is like the end of the railing kind of just like on broken drywall just not like like it was glued <laughs> to the wall but then because someone like grabbed oh the God. railing like it broke from the wall but the piece of the drywall <laughs> still stuck on it so you have this broken dry and like the end of the railing it was crazy and it kept cutting back to it and that's the only other thing in the frame besides him <laughs> and i'm like you could you could change the the way you shoot it like you you could just have him move over slightly or move the camera over slightly mm -hmm. so that that's not in the frame the entire time, constantly cutting back to it. Very interesting. This is what, like a thousand dollar budget? Like what, what did they make this on? Like I don't know, because it's a, <laughs> it's a Nigerian film. This could be considered Nollywood is the term. And even mm -hmm. on the Wikipedia page, it the, there's you know the the fact that there's no clear definition for Nollywood other than just a film from Nigeria is mentioned. Any variety mm -hmm. of budgets, apparently. So I I you know there's a scene where the the bank manager, you know, he's trying to get the info from the bank manager because he sees because his email is synced up to or sorry her email is synced up to his 
not only his phone but also his computer and he sees yeah. two million <laughs> nigerian dollars get withdrawn from her bank account so i got some i was like okay somebody convert this it's apparently like 1700 canadian so i don't know what they're you know <laughs> i don't know what 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 how much money you're supposed to spend on a film in nigeria this is the first nigerian film that i've seen i think yeah we assume yeah so <laughs> i don't i don't know what i don't know what the budget was <laughs> i don't know what the budget was supposed to be the costumes were crazy though if you can get 14 and 14 plus in one year must be must be manageable. Yeah, definitely the entire production was like a week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That yeah. much is clear. Filmed in two days, edited in <laughs> half a day. <laughs> like, it written in a weekend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a I would for sure recommend this film. Oh yeah. Yeah, so would I. It, it flies by as well, like hour and a half. Like barely, <laughs> <laughs> barely feature. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 def it's definitely entertaining if if you like Neil Breen <laughs> and the room. <laughs> <laughs> they were definitely they were throwing a ball at each other in the middle of the conversation scene. I was like, damn, this really is the room here. Yeah, they even probably had to do a take more than once with the uh, the basketball through the hoop. Shot even. Mm. You never know. Yeah. That's dedication. But what was what was <laughs> what was with that scene? Uh it was like a flash they do various flashbacks to like how strong the relationship was or whatever. Yes. And there's one where the wife character comes home like really happy because she can feed like ten thousand children or something, she says. Because <laughs> of a an and the, the the husband's like, oh, how did you do that? And she's like, oh, I got we got an anonymous donation. <laughs> it was enormous. And then he's like smirking, and she's like, oh, wait, was that you? He's, he's like, yeah, it was me. <laughs> I got other people like, to donate so I could make it an obscene amount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like they never explain what this guy like does, did they? Like they never. <laughs> Very rich and powerful. He apparently just owns everything in Nigeria. He owns the police. <laughs> and still can't figure out when his wife just disappears for a year. <laughs> oh my god. We can't forget to mention the beard. <laughs> that was like yeah, what is the flash forward that was the with the beard and then he, yeah, part. just for him to shave immediately to It was like one year later. And he's like doing the pouty face and he's like, his hair is longer and he's got this, <laughs> the fakest fucking beard I've seen since like the end of Jackass number two. It was basically the same. It was like yeah. a pu pubic beard. <laughs> and, and he, and he, he, he takes off like a tiny bit with the razor. It just kind of like falls <laughs> off. I was really hoping that they'd commit to like the full shaving scene, but then they kind of oh, just yeah. like cut. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like, okay, well you still... You've still got a beard. It's just more. Tri I don't know how you did that with a razor. <laughs> I don't know how you did that with a. That doesn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah, he just goes. Yeah, he goes back to exactly how he looked before. Yeah, that's hilarious. It was great. Trying to indicate time passing. And the, but... like, it only sh <laughs> like it, it it existed and then disappeared. There was no real reason to have that. It just it, he immediately <laughs> shaved it off as soon as we it cut to one year later and then well, I'll take get rid of it. <laughs> they'd already yeah established that it was a year later like with text like showing the beard like just do one or the other way like yeah it's so stupid it was great yeah so I'm just they were definitely using lav mics mm -hmm. they probably explains why they're so muffled yeah it's one of those situations where yeah like it probably would have been better just to use the audio from the camera no matter what the mic was on the camera like it probably would have been better well yeah it, honestly if that was the level if what they were using was what they recorded on set they needed to adr this whole thing yeah like they needed to madame web it yeah yeah because it is it's it's honestly like unlistenable uh, it's, yeah. it's like really difficult to tell what they're saying if you don't have subtitles a lot of the time. 
Yeah, it's a it's a crazy decision because, you know, you could you could have something that looks out of sync. But if you can tell what they're saying, that's probably the preferred outcome. Rather than. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do, would you even describe it as a decision? It seems like a lack thereof. They didn't even care. Like, they didn't <laughs> even think. Yeah, like it needed even. <laughs> it's weird because it doesn't matter. Like the the sets are flat, and the way it's shot is really bland, and the way it's lit is really like overly done. But like the cameras, like the fo- the focus was in focus. Oh yeah, the cinema. Uh, you'd never you expect could, like, by skipping through the movie that the cinematography <laughs> would be better than the audio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it like really doesn't match. Like the audio is significantly worse than the already like not impressive visuals. <laughs> it's shocking. It's genuine I like I, I'm not kidding when I say it might be like the worst out of any movie I've ever seen. It's the standout <laughs> feature for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh and uh, they just take it to the funniest places in such like an earnest way like the whole shrink thing like getting the shrink in there the conversations they get yeah from that, it's like this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> and she like she changes her style up a lot in every scene too yeah yeah they are like totally bombarding you with the like, <laughs> costumes and like <laughs> the color of the real cruella <laughs> yeah. Damn. They really should get a costume num for like Honestly, most yeah. costumes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's one of the it's one of the more notable things about the mm-hmm. film, honestly. Yeah. They they're they they always look crazy. But I guess it's supposed to be like, oh, he's so rich. He's so rich he has those yeah, costumes. Is, is that what they're is that what they're saying? I that? think that's the implication. <laughs> He's such a rich guy. And then, yeah, the the therapist, she kind of seemed like she didn't really want to be there. <laughs> she she was not really... I mean, <laughs> sure, it's revealed later that, what, she had a science degree? Because <laughs> she needed that to get the meds. She wasn't a real therapist. Right. So she was a plant to trick him into being anesthetized. It was a nice attempt at... Uh a montage for the the therapy sequences like showing the passage of time with uh how many all, the, all of his sessions um and the camera was moving mm-hmm. <laughs> there was so, something was happening um so that was notable yeah it's like yeah every now and again they'd, they'd like remember oh yeah like this is a movie i guess <laughs> we can is like it? go somewhere or do something we can move the camera we can have a overly blaring piano smash something out in the background <laughs> when they showed him playing the piano that was that was <laughs> yeah, like yeah. top one <laughs> like <laughs> fake piano playing <laughs> i've seen in a movie that was so good i was actually unsure that it was supposed to be diegetic until he stopped playing and the piano <laughs> noise stopped. <laughs> like, I was like, is it, is, it, is it a part of the soundtrack that's just happening and he, we're, we're not hearing what he's playing? But no, he was, he was playing that in the universe. That Liu character was perfect. That actor brought it. He carries the whole thing on his back. It's like awesome what he brings to it, both unintentional and intentional <laughs> <laughs> he's crying when he needs to he's yeah. getting those tears he's bringing that emotion yeah. he's, br- he's bringing that intensity <laughs> bringing them slaps he's and... bringing that drip <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, he, he does he has like this pouty face for so much of the film and it just works so well comedically it's very special <laughs> yeah i gotta get some screenshots of that some some of them are just like it's like perfect comedic <laughs> stuff right there. <laughs> yeah, the crickets were a good character. I like the crickets. <laughs> they represented a fair amount of the runtime. You can't escape them. <laughs> <laughs> They're just there. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
hold on. There's another note here. <laughs> oh my god. Sorry, I'm just trying to. I saw something earlier and then I forgot. If you have something to say, go for it. I'll I'll remember it. No, that's most of like I've gone through most of my notes now. That's more than what I was anticipating, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I think it is a little bit of a diamond in the rough. This one. Did you uh, did you get caught off guard by the pillow that looked like a PNG image? That's not that's not ringing a bell. Pillow that looks like a PNG. Okay, yeah, because there's there's just the way that it's lit. It looks. It's not, but it looks like it's just photoshopped into the environment just because of <laughs> the way that it like kind of pops in the set. The sets were pretty great. There's the broken railing. Very like I, I would. I, I, that's like an accident waiting to happen. I can't believe they actually like worked with that. Like lawsuit stuff. <laughs> Lots of like Ikea type set decoration you know like just this thing on the wall that says love <laughs> yeah Aww. yeah i guess they love each other and like the same consistent light source like from yeah. every angle and the like huge painting that's not hung up but is just sitting on top of like a piece of furniture like a, a drawer <laughs> that was fun it's got a great mise-en-scene they will look like showrooms yeah. Like no, no, no one's actually lived in any of these spaces. No. They're all, they're just sound stages. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, a very gripping thriller. Twists and turns? Still don't know what he does for work, but he's able to like leave the office for a year and then get right back to it. So whatever job you can do that. <laughs> That's just part of the commentary. Because uh, he's of, so uh, powerful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're looking for a, a yeah. good watch, to freedom. Yeah, how, how would someone actually like find this? <laughs> it's on Amazon. It's on Amazon Prime. Oh, is it on, oh, Prime Video is, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. It's included with Prime. Legends. Hell yeah. So there's no excuse then. No excuse. And it has subtitles there. I think. Or at least that's what my my tortilla said it was from. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of water bottles without labels. <laughs> His hospital was like that was a good bed for a hospital. Who knows if he was actually in one. Why did she come back to tell him all that? There's no way. He, she could have just left. Why did she feel the need to like... She was so confident about him not only being conscious enough to understand her, but being like sedated enough to not be able to like do anything <laughs> about it to, yeah. while she was standing there. That's a, that's a lot of confidence for someone who's trying to run away from an abuser. It did give it a nice punchy dramatic effect though did it not yeah yeah <laughs> it's a very dramatic film lots yeah, of punchy emotion laughter <laughs> it's the main yeah, yeah. <laughs> the main one it doesn't it doesn't feel like everyone just met for the first time <laughs> in every scene <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, so uh, <laughs> if you want to see one of the 18 movies that this director directed in 2023, I would say To Freedom <laughs> is probably your best bet. And they leave it on a yeah. cliffhanger. I want to see a sequel. Make this Biodin Stevens' most successful film and Tiger Fire Rose, the Ooh, writer. Yeah. And I guess like the sequel you could even get clever with and just TWO Freedom. Oh. You know? <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> or Two Freedom 2. <laughs> equally <laughs> a fun title. We've got options. <laughs> yeah. From Freedom. <laughs> two f Freedoms. <laughs> two opposite of Freedom. <laughs> to Jail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would like... Cause, if we if the second movie is him hunting her down, I'm gonna get you. But it's like the most <laughs> powerful man ever. Like I want to see what they do with that setup. 
Like they've set up some really interesting things here. I want to see. I want to see more in this universe, and I want to see where this goes. Yeah, I'm with you. There's potential. There's building potential. We could get to like a saw type. Oh yeah. Situation. Yeah. <laughs> we can have <laughs> this guy of versus and jigsaw. Turns. That would be <laughs> an omniscient, powerful, <laughs> omnipresent <laughs> villain. We're just about there, anyway. Yeah, we're pretty much there. <laughs> Yeah, great performances, great audio, the best audio ever. Soundtrack, so good. Some of it reminded me of Super Seducer. Some of it reminded me of Gone Girl. <laughs> some of it reminded me of free play piano, uh, dramatic music. Um, costumes, fucking incredible. Incredible <laughs> costumes. Acting, amazing. Yeah, everything great. This was a real, should I give it a one or a 10? Yeah, yeah, I'm feeling similar energy. But I decided on a one myself. Maybe on a rewatch I'll give it a ten. For now I'm giving it a one, yeah. Yeah, I'm going one star like. <laughs> Gotta get the like in there. <laughs> I think that makes it clear what we're dealing with here. I think the yeah, to to release the film in that state it's kinda unacceptable. <laughs> it's like, but that, <laughs> yeah, that it's, audio, I'm like It's more than kinda. It's straight. It's like it's like unforgivably unwatchable with that audio. Like just that one change would probably give it another star. Yeah, entirely. Like it's that bad. You can't have made this film and pretended like you didn't know that that was an issue. You can't. You can't possibly yeah, release that and pre- like you're basically like it's like a <laughs> scam almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like the audio source is changing by cut, so like they must know. <laughs> yeah, it's not an accident. Yes, yes, mad. Yeah, you you have to you have <laughs> to have for sure seen the film <laughs> before <laughs> releasing it, right? Hopefully, but Biod and Steven might be so busy he didn't have time. Oh yeah, eighteen. The, so uh, that's more months than are in a year. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's Dude. like a movie and a half per month. Every month. Something this good, hopefully, is more like. than that. Is it? No, that's about it. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, about yeah, yeah. A movie yeah, one and a half movies per month. There's some months where you make two movies. Do you, yeah. Do you think if you if you really put your head down, you could make two to freedoms a month? Yeah. No excuse not to make a sequel is all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I would buy a Blu-ray. I'd buy a 4K. As long as the Blu-ray has subtitles. If it doesn't have subtitles, I will not buy a Blu-ray. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great film. Uh, it was a real, one of the best blind buys, blind watches. Yeah, yeah. It could have gone. It could have gone wrong, but I'm, I'm glad it worked out. It went. It went uh, perfect. We finally got a bit of to freedom in our lives. Yeah. Finally. F- finally you know way more entertaining than sound of freedom so oh much more oh christ whoever uploaded <laughs> that tortilla with the title sound of freedom although perhaps malicious <laughs> in intent was actually a very nice thing to do <laughs> it, it it probably saved a lot of people you know, it's probably a better movie night for most people than if they had actually Definitely, downloaded Sound yeah. of Freedom. It, uh, and some of the Letterboxd reviews confirm this. At too. the very least, it exposed us to it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, at the very least, we can thank them for that. <laughs> it probably is the most exposure the film <laughs> will ever get. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question time. <laughs> okay, let's do some questions from the Sardonicast community. I've got to shake that freedom from out my mouth. Um, if you want to leave your own questions for future episodes, head over to the suggestion thread on the subreddit. Just like Aternerniri said, "Careful, who composed? Yeah, <laughs> who composed the Sardonicast jingle? If it was one of you, what was the mindset you had when composing it?" What is your overall thought process when composing music? If you look in the description of most episode, I think it gives away the answer to this. But mm-hmm. I think, Adam, you can 
You can answer the creative process behind that one. I did it. Um, yeah, I do music. Uh, would love to, you know, get some. I'm, I'm, I'm in that position where I'm like, okay, I want to record more, but I need to get like an actual producer or something to help me with like the mixing and stuff, mm. and just like have like a professional voice on it, because, you know, I'm, I, I feel like my strength is composing, just writing it. Yeah. And like, you know, having a vision for how I want it to sound. But um, in terms terms of the actual like practicality, I would love to just yeah, I would love to be in like a professional environment for that. So I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, when it came to the jingle, I think it I think it took like a few hours of just like me fucking mm-hmm. around. Just playing. And I wanted something that was not overly serious, not overly long. And I guess in my head, I also had kind of like a, I don't remember if I had an idea of, of like the, the images showing up on the beat when I was composing it. I think I probably did from mm-hmm. memory. of like, bam, bam, bam. Yeah. Just, just an, just a nice little jingle that is, damn, I see this, this is exactly my problem with music is that I have, I'm, I'm really mm-hmm. good at, having a feeling and conveying that through music, but I'm not great at describing that for, from like any sense of proper terminology. Like verbally, yeah. My language is in the music itself. And so in my head, I've got an exact idea of like the type of emotion that I was aiming for, but it's really difficult to say it in words because to me, the language is the music itself. And I and I, I communicated yeah. it through the music, but I it's difficult for me not it's difficult for me to I, I don't have the, the vocabulary for it. I think yeah. I think for it it speaks for itself in that sense. Um and yeah, I don't think you even really need the words to you you can just listen. I think it communicates the ideas you're trying to communicate. It's kind of whimsy with the sardonic under mm-hmm. tones, I think that comes across. Yeah. yeah. I got a piano next to me right now. <laughs> yeah. It's the it's the C sharp that really adds a lot of the character to it, I think. Because it almost the like bah, 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 the the root note it enforces this almost kind of like in the first few seconds you almost kind of feel like it's like mildly sinister but like in a playful way still yeah yeah playful like kind of like a like a 70s cheese villain or something like we Mm -hmm. were just talking about like ralph bakshi or something vaudeville kind of yeah i i feel that way about the last note as well the way it kind of throws you off right at the end yeah yeah it's fun yeah nice um Let's do this one from Joe R C K. How do you feel about yellow paint in video games? The whole discourse around this is that the yellow paint in video games shows you what's obviously interactable and it's talking down to you. While the other side says it helps differentiate from all the visual clutter in the scene. Now, do you know anything about uh, this kind of ongoing argument? Yeah. It's been happening in the video game space. Um, I don't know who started uh, it, if it was Naughty Dog with Uncharted. Because that was... They might have popularized it. Uh, yeah. Because I remember like Enslaved, Odyssey to the West, and all these kind of games all following similar kind of design trends and patterns. That It's just that kind of, you know, over-the-shoulder third-person action trope is how, is how you funnel people through environments is yeah you yeah make the vines an off green or you you have the paint which is what the question was getting at the like yellow paint on the the cliff edges to indicate stuff you can climb on yeah um, well in the uncharted games like a lot of the time it's not so egregious like sure the yellow paint exists in some environments but you know yeah i'm trying to it's like okay i you could see like the the shading of like the different type of snow basically. So I think that having some sort of indication in the environment, like a slight color palette change on some of the edges or something really helps Mm -hmm. 
because you know if in a in a game that's linear anyway the least fun thing to do in one of those games is try to figure out where to go next so Mm -hmm. if it's linear anyway then sure there i there's probably should be some strong indication of where you're supposed to go because i i just don't want to be fucking around trying to you know going in circles like where am i supposed to go yeah yeah because sometimes it's not obvious for me so I don't yeah know. It, i definitely understand why it needs to be there i just only think it becomes a problem when the the focus testing is so blatant that the game is oh. like not even willing to give you a chance to like explore like sony are getting worse and worse for this like <laughs> i don't know if you've ever tried these um these Horizon Zero Dawn games, but they are particularly bad for it. The no. last one that came out a couple of years ago that has this this kind of problem where like the second you get into a puzzle room or something, within ten seconds the character is like, Hey, that thing up there looks interactable. We should go oh, touch I hate that. that. Yeah. Oh, you you know, and it's like constant Especially when you're like already doing it. <laughs> and <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the the second God of War was really bad for that as well. Just the hand-holdy, like... Man, like, uh, at least try and obscure this a little bit. Like, try and hide this a little bit so I'm not thinking about it as much. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, just in that first God of War, I thought it was more acceptable and was kind of built into the narrative a little bit more with the the spoilers. Spoilers for God of War 1, I guess. Um, God of War remake. 2018 or whatever, whatever we oh. call it um mm. there was the, the the like symbols by anything you'd climb and it was like explained that it was messages left by your wife or whatever and so there was at least some kind of some reasoning for it to be there um and as you say it was a lot more linear <clears throat> god of war is not really about the the climbing and traversal to me so it doesn't really bug me there whereas yeah it, it is way more distracting in a horizon or just yeah. something where it's not diegetic to the environment and it's like come on this is just too obvious like i want to feel like there's at least an environment i'm coming yeah to, i'm traversing there is a delicate balance to strike where you don't want it to feel condescending i feel like naughty dog struck that balance pretty well with the uncharted games in terms of you know just figuring out where to go in the cliff edges and just the, like the, the it seemed you know, not every environment, but a lot of them, it was relatively subtle, but still clear. Subtle, but clear. Like, mm-hmm. it, it wasn't... They didn't have characters shouting it at you throughout the entire thing. You know, yeah. Maybe some sections, if you pressed the help button, then you could get that in, yeah. like, a puzzle, maybe. And the reason, the reason devs feel compelled to do it is because, yeah, people will get stuck, and in testing, they'll be, like someone who gets stuck in the same corner for like five hours and it's like man we could just avoid this if we put a bit of paint on the wall or something like i remember a funny funny story about the original the original dead space um where you know the whole conceit is like you got to shoot the limbs pointless aiming for the head like you got to go for the limbs um yeah but people in qa just weren't picking up that that was like the core mechanic of everything so they wound up in the environment just writing everywhere in blood shoot the limbs yeah, like yeah. in huge writing everywhere everywhere so people understand and actually get get into through the thick skulls that that's like a core mechanic of the game and it's like yeah a delicate balance of like when does it become condescending and how much is actually essential to get your product like out the door and yeah <laughs> broadly successful i wasn't off put by that in dead space per se cuz I feel like, you know, the it adds to the character of the universe to have people like writing messages yeah, and, and, part of the whole and stuff and like, oh, you know, it's almost like a trope, you know, 28 days later, there are people writing things on the walls like the end is fucking yeah, dying yeah. and stuff like that. So to have one of those things in the environment be helpful to how you play the game, I don't see a big issue with, but I'm wondering what the alternative would have been in that game to something like that like i I would rather have that than like a a fucking cortana type character telling you or Uh you know lecturing you, literally just saying 
like as a blatant tutorial or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think especially once we've left the once games left like the two D perspective, like and we we'll get into the three D space, it's just it's just so much, so many complicated uh, mechanics you can establish that teaching them naturally is uh, something that just so many games struggle with. You know, like mm-hmm. the, loads of Nintendo games do it. They have these slow ass beginnings, just setting up mechanics, just in a super plodding way. Like, yeah, loads of games do it because it is really difficult uh, to communicate <laughs> all these concepts to, yeah, uh, people all around the world. All yeah. It goes beyond language. It goes beyond, yeah, it's just like pure visual communication. I wonder um, what, they're, what, what they consider to be like a success rate for the QA testing. Because like... I think no matter how blatant you make something, there's always going to be some people that either have a brain fart or just can't figure it out. Remember the Cuphead, yeah. the infamous Cuphead tutorial? Clip? Oh, Notorious, yeah. yeah. Was that GameSpot or something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, really embarrassing. Um, but yeah, it does happen. It can happen. Yeah, there's a, there's a yeah, balance there to strike and uh, different games require different contexts. So and yeah, you you definitely notice it when it goes <laughs> out of bounds into a into that c- condescending territory. Yeah, where it feels like it's, e. was this a baby game? I think I'm a baby over here. Um, yeah. Um, how about this one from Shadow Conspiracy? <gasps> what movie scenes on rewatch still gives y'all goosebumps today? And what non kids movie? Did you love when you were younger, but now cringe at? Keep all, keep up all the good work, boys. I happen to have... It wasn't this last weekend, but the weekend before. I had a very eclectic day of watching... I, <laughs> I rewatched Come and See. Then I watched <laughs> G-Force. Yeah. Then I watched uh, The Zone of Interest. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Um. Uh, and yeah, obviously, G Force is the most no nah, joke. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> c- come and see had the the gives me there are multiple moments in that movie that give me like a spine chilling uh, sense of goosebumps. Uh, but there's a particular scene where the the boy uh, revisits his family home. Um, and just the the way, without any dialogue, the visuals enforce the the horror he's been mm-hmm. placed in uh, is extremely effective, and uh, yeah, almost makes me, f- me feel ill, like in a in an effective way with how with how powerful just the sequence of images is in that film. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, honestly, like any movie, I give a ten. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's something that like upon repeated viewings I'm still able to feel things from like no matter how many times I watch Kill Bill there's always so many like satisfying or emotional sequences in that yeah there, I mean like it, it's the list isn't short I would say like no, no country for old men like still mm-hmm. the, the sequence it, it, it has to, a lot to do with just how things are presented and the flow of the editing and the sound design and the how it's shot. Yeah, L- lots of Coen Brothers uh, scenes yeah. actually do that. Where it, the, the way they run, it demands your attention. Hmm. Or like, yeah, crescendos to a certain piece of dialogue or a memorable moment or something clever it comes back on itself. Yeah. I'm trying to think of uh, non-kids movies that I watched when I was younger. Yeah, I've been trying to think of that. Because there would probably be some, like, when I was 13. Like, you know, I just... just, There's a lot of movies that I would just watch that I watched fairly uncritically. Yeah, that's just kind of what you do at that age. Like, I'm thinking, like, probably, like, the Tim Burton Batman or something like that. I haven't seen that probably since I was a kid. I'm sure there would be... 
some uh, funny age stuff in that now. Damn, there's one that's in my mind, and I can't remember what the fuck it's called or what. Like, there's just I'm getting like these weird, tiny flashbacks, these tiny little snapshots of things that I watched when I was younger. Um, fuck, what was it called? Ooh, I think LL Cool J was in it. I'm just going to look through his filmography real quick. <laughs> I think of shit like Titan AE. It was still, I think, supposed to be a kid's movie, but like just slightly more adult leaning. Um, it's got some real cringe stuff now. Yeah, there was, a, there was a movie called Mind Hunters from 2004 that I definitely watched more than once when I was a kid, but not like... You know, I think even like only a couple of years later, I rewatched it and was like, eh, this is not great. There's like fucking. Oh, this. <laughs> you, just, you just reminded me of one. Um... Oh, go for it. Go- Gothica from 2000. Oh, you watched it in like uncritically? Um, I don't even remember if I watched it. I think I might have caught a bit of it on TV or something. Yeah. Like I, I thought it was like the most intense thing I'd ever seen when I was like nine years old. Um, <laughs> that was a weird one that just hit me, I guess, at the right time, um, which I'm sure is hilarious now. It's another one I probably haven't seen in a couple decades. <laughs> yeah, I would love to watch that. Yeah, 28 weeks later, I watched pretty uncritically, and that one aged like milk. Yeah, that's a good one. But I don't know if any of these are ones that I like really connected with. I kind of just like watched them, and then it ended, and then I didn't think much about them. Uh-huh. Like I didn't, I didn't go like hell yeah. <laughs> I just kind of <laughs> didn't realize what it meant for a movie to be bad, or for my experience not to be like yeah, yeah. as as yeah, impactful as a good movie could be. Those fucking mind hunters. Yeah, I think I did enjoy <laughs> mind hunters when I was younger. I'm remembering parts about it. It was so dumb. <laughs> I don't know. That that's crazy that I even remembered that that existed. Yeah, sometimes the questions they just make you whip out a deep pool. Mm-hmm. LL Cool J, the coolest <laughs> of two L's. Deep Blue Sea. I'd imagine if I rewatched that, it would be much more lame. But I I liked that a lot. Oh, Deep Blue Sea. That's a good pick. Yeah. No. I, yeah. I was that younger. that was one I had my rotation when I was younger. Yeah. Um, just that one shot of Sam Jackson. It didn't matter if the rest yeah. of the movie was dumb because that that was just the best, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> most unexpected. <laughs> uh, I have a flashback. We had a um, we had like a really tiny, like. I guess tube TV or CRT TV. I I don't know what to call it, but it was Mm -hmm. like an old television. And I think it had a VHS player built into the bottom of it. Yeah. I have one of those. And it was small enough to fit like kind of, it was so small that it fit in between like, like on the, you know, in a vehicle between the two front seats, there's like this little uh, thing that, you know, sometimes could open up and you can like put change in it or something. We put that there. And then my brother and I would be like in the back of the van or whatever and like go to the cabin <laughs> we'd watch a movie on on the way with like headphones or something and i i have this distinct memory of we were like i guess we picked up my granny and pretty much as soon as she got into the vehicle and then just looked at the tv the sam jackson <laughs> thing happened she was like oh <laughs> she, she was <laughs> disturbed by it and i found that very amusing oh man yeah all the memories are flooding back now. There's a deep blue sea. tube ray shark movies. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah, well, there was a lot of like outside of the kids' movies. I was only really interested in stuff like Deep Blue Sea and uh, American Wealth in London and like horror stuff, really. Yeah. Yeah. Looking for that kind of experience. It, it is a very oh, um, child turning into adult, but not quite. Yeah, genre. You're just like you're testing what you can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what you can take. Yeah. What, uh, dude? The shark, bro. <laughs> that an epic. That kind of epic. True epic. The meg epic. Meg epic. <laughs> That's what they should call the third one. 
Meg epic. Me- Meg epic. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, should we should we do one more? All right, one, one more. Let's end on this one from Real Big Dog Two. Uh, Are you more forgiving to a bad movie or a bad game? Um, movie probably. <laughs> the, what what a movie is asking of you is a lot lower than what a game is asking. Uh, like a, what? Like a, a game like Ride to Hell Retribution compared to mm. a movie like Waterworld. Like I don't know. I'd rather just watch Waterworld probably. Whereas like. Games are long too, you know. Like I, I even tried with uh, Life is Strange, which was like that was getting a, that was a good yeah. balance for me, where I was fi- I was finding it funny, and was like having a good time, like laughing at the dialogue and stuff. But then I you got hella saved my life. <laughs> but then I like it got to some gameplay moment. Was like find five bottles, and I was like, nah, this sucks. I can't. This- can't be doing this. Where it's like a, a movie's not going to stop. Did like, you did you get through that part in fucking the new Spider Man though? Uh, <laughs> w- which one? <laughs> Cleaning your house. <laughs> oh yeah, but that was like that was like The Last of Us. So it was fire. <laughs> yeah, they think they're Naughty Dog. I'm almost I I'm almost finished that game. Can't believe oh, have it. You? Yeah. Wow. I'm I'm like all I'm close to the end. Damn. Yeah. I re- I'm surprised. <laughs> That does surprise doing me. Like a couple hours every two weeks. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's quite a, a step down with the story for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, that's a weird question because I don't know if I give anything any extra or lesser credit because of the medium. I think it's just you judge pieces of art within the context of that medium. So you know, if a if a game's really bad. It's you have to look at what kind of resources they had in the same way that you would a film, right? Like it's it's so much more embarrassing and sad when you have a blueprint of how the story works. Let's say you're doing the old boy remake, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, where where and you have millions of dollars and like professionals working with you. And it still like turns out to be a piece of shit or like the last airbender, right? Like it's worse Mm -hmm. in that sense than if like you were creating like a new ambitious story that had never been seen before and you were trying to do like blah, blah, blah. Like there's excuses you can give anything, whether it be a movie or a game, just based on what they had to work with or what they should have reasonably been able to accomplish. You know, I look at something like Madam Web. I'm like, I there's a lot of shit in there where someone trying to make a bad movie couldn't do that. It's like almost <laughs> impressive. <laughs> yeah. Know? But like Madam Web is funnier to me than like more interesting to me than like a, like an asset flip that's on like PSN. Like mm. what was it called? Like life of black tiger or whatever. So, oh, something shit. like that. Yeah. Where, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, some of those bottom of the barrel bad games are just unplayable. Like you can't get through them. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, like, even the worst films I've ever seen, like, it's it's asking so little of me. Yeah, you know, I don't. I, don't, <laughs> For, I can get to. The, I can at least get to the end. Whereas when, like, there are many bad games I could not get to the end of. Like literally, like hunt hunt down the fremen. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can't uh, you can't even beat it without well, yeah. like well, hacking yeah, the game. Well, like you, it's literally <laughs> yeah. like you're you're locked. It's literally unbeatable. You know, there's like a a task force like desperately trying to fix that game still. Oh, <laughs> 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 like I check in every now and again. Um, still going. <laughs> that's like this Discord. It's <laughs> like trying to repair it. Yeah. <laughs> Get emails now and again. Yeah, it's like hilarious. That's great. Yeah, I, I, someone someone gifted me it like uh, <laughs> a few years ago. I still haven't even played that one. I'd love to do that at some point. Maybe maybe it's maybe you can finish it now. <laughs> yeah, <sighs> yeah. I guess bad movies are more fun than bad games. Yeah, yeah. That's where I'd, I'd stand. Although Ride to Hell Retribution was hilarious. Yeah, but I, I got more enjoyment watching 
other people talk about it than actually yeah. like sitting down and playing it myself. It's one of those things where it's like if you're making content out of it, it it's a little yeah. better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, I guess that's it for questions. Damn. Yeah, I think we did it. And it's time for you to recommend a film. Yeah, it's time for me to recommend a film. And I picked something I don't think either of us have seen. The filmmaker that I've like honestly tried to avoid. Uh-oh. Um but I think I think this could make a <laughs> interesting conversation. I want to talk about two thousand and one film Moulin Rouge by Baz Luhrmann. Uh all right. Yeah. All right. Um, Is that the, like that's the his good one, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's his highest rated, best reviewed one. I think the only other film I've seen his Romeo and Juliet, and oh, I yeah. think I saw The Great Gatsby, but outside of that, um, no. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how this goes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Spelled M O U L I N space R O U G E exclamation point, if anybody's trying to find this. From 2001, Nicole Kidman, Ewan McGregor, directed by. Baz Luhrmann. Ew. Ew. And if you don't want to be spoiled for <laughs> Moulin Rouge, how do you even... It doesn't seem like it would be pronounced Moulin. I'll have to look that up. Moulin? Yeah. <laughs> Moulin Rouge? Rouge? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I got no clue. We'll figure it out. If you don't want to be spoiled for that, watch it before the next episode. These episodes come out every two weeks. You can listen to them early by going to sardonicast.com. Sign up for premium. It's only $2 a month. Also, patreon.com slash sardonicast. Also, we got merch. Link in the description. Also, there's a sardonicast highlights channel. Also, you can search that on YouTube. Clips from the show and stuff. All right. That was fun. Yeah. To freedom. Well, dooned out. Happy freedom, everybody. Yeah, happy dune. Happy spice. Spice up your life. People of the world. Spice up your life, everybody and every girl. Spice up your life. Happy the tooth. Remember the tooth. Remember the tooth. Thanks for listening, everybody. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye.